Words of wisdom, number one. Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once advised Kamil ibn Ziyad, may Allah have mercy on him, that people are of three types, the devoted scholar, the one who seeks knowledge in order to save themselves, and the worthless riffraff who follow every caller, bending with every wind. They do not seek guidance with knowledge, and they do not hold on to a strong pillar and support. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, page 348. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2322, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that everything in this material world is cursed except the remembrance of Allah, the Exalted, what is connected to it, the knowledgeable person and the student of knowledge. The remembrance of Allah, the Exalted, encompasses all the levels of remembrance. Namely, internal silent remembrance, which includes correcting one's intention, so that they only act for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. Remembering Allah, the Exalted, via the tongue and the most important, is practically remembering Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. Anything which leads to the remembrance of Allah, the Exalted, includes the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, such as striving in the material world in order to fulfill one's necessities and the necessities of their dependents according to the teachings of Islam without waste, excessiveness or extravagance. In reality, this includes any action which appears worldly or religious as long as it involves the obedience of Allah, the Exalted. Both the knowledgeable person and the student of knowledge are the only people in reality who will obey Allah, the Exalted, correctly, as this is not possible to achieve without knowledge. An ignorant person disobeys Allah, the Exalted, without even realizing it, as they are unaware of what counts as a sin or a righteous deed. In some cases, one may even believe they are strictly obeying Him, even though they are far from it. To conclude, in reality nothing is really cursed in the material world in itself. It is how a thing is used which determines if it is cursed or not. For example, if wealth is used correctly according to the teachings of Islam, then it is a great blessing in both worlds. But if it is misused or hoarded, then it will become a curse for its owner in both worlds. This can be applied to all things in this world. Words of Wisdom Number 2 Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once advised that knowledge is superior to wealth. Knowledge protects a person, whereas wealth needs to be protected. Wealth decreases with spending, whereas knowledge increases with it. Knowledge is a faith to be followed. It helps one practice sincere obedience to Allah, the Exalted, and leaves a beautiful legacy after their death, whereas the benefits of wealth cease with its ceasing. And knowledge rules, while wealth is ruled over. The learned remain as long as the world remains. Their persons may be lost, but their teachings live on in the hearts of people. This has been discussed in Imam Abu Naim al-Asfahani's Hilyat al awliya W.A. Tabaka al-Asfiyah, narration 164. Knowledge teaches one how to use their blessings correctly, therefore ensuring they benefit from them in both worlds. Whereas, wealth will be left behind and not aid one at the time of their death, in their grave and on judgment day. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6442, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that a person's true wealth is what they send ahead to the hereafter whereas, what they leave behind is in reality the wealth of their inheritors. It is important for Muslims to send as many blessings, such as their wealth, as they can to the hereafter by using them in ways which are pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. This includes spending on one's needs and the needs of their dependents without being wasteful, excessive or extravagant. This has been advised in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 4006. But if a Muslim does not use their blessings correctly, they will become a burden for them in both worlds. And if they hoard them and leave them behind for their inheritors, then they will be held accountable for obtaining them, even though others will enjoy them after they depart. This has been indicated in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2379. In addition, if their inheritors use the blessings correctly, then they will obtain reward from Allah, the Exalted, 
while the one who collected it will be left empty-handed on judgment day. Or their inheritor will misuse the blessings, which will become a great regret for both the one who earned the blessing and their inheritor, especially if they did not teach their inheritor, such as their child, how to correctly use the blessings, as this is a duty on them. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2928. Muslims should therefore fulfill their responsibilities towards Allah, the exalted, and people, and ensure they take the rest of their blessings with them to the hereafter by using them correctly as prescribed by Islam. Otherwise, they will be left empty-handed and full of regrets on Judgment Day. Words of Wisdom Number 3 Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once said that a true scholar is the one who does not make others despair from the mercy of Allah, the Exalted, nor do they make them feel safe from his punishment. This has been discussed in Ibn al jawsis Safachal Safwa, 1 170th. This indicates the importance of striking a balance between fear and hope in Allah, the Exalted. In a long divine narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7405, Allah, the Exalted, advises that he ACTS and treats his servant according to their perception of him. This means if a Muslim has good thoughts and expects good from Allah, the Exalted, he in turn will not disappoint them. Similarly, if a person harbors negative thoughts about Allah, the Exalted, such as believing they will not be forgiven, then Allah, the Exalted, may act according to their belief. It is important to note, there is a vast difference between true hope in Allah, the Exalted, which this narration refers to, and wishful thinking. Wishful thinking is when one fails to strive in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience, and then expects Allah, the Exalted, to forgive them. This is not true hope, it is merely wishful thinking. This is like a farmer who fails to plant any seeds, fails to water their crop, and still hopes to reap a large harvest. True hope is when one strives to obey Allah, the Exalted, and whenever they slip up they sincerely repent, and then hope for the mercy and forgiveness of Allah, the Exalted. This is like a farmer who plants seeds, waters their crop, dedicates effort to keeping the crop healthy, and then hopes for a large harvest. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has summarized this explanation in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2459. Generally speaking, a Muslim should harbor more fear of Allah, the Exalted, during their life as it prevents sins which is superior to hope, which inspires one to perform righteous deeds especially, the voluntary type. But during periods of illness and difficulty, and especially at the time of death, a Muslim should have nothing but hope in the mercy of Allah, the Exalted, even if they have spent their life disobeying Him, as this has specifically been commanded by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 2877. Commanding correctly. Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once warned that one of the reasons why people have little interest in seeking knowledge is that they observe how a knowledgeable person benefits little from their knowledge. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, volume 1, page 356. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3267, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that the one who contradicts their own advice when commanding good and forbidding evil will be punished in hell. Instead of following in the footsteps of the righteous predecessors by advising only for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, many people advise for other reasons, such as to gain popularity and worldly things. For example, some scholars often strive to be in the spotlight of gatherings and events, and are not pleased with a seat which is to one side, as they desire a central seat. When their intention became like this Allah, the Exalted, removed the positive effect of their advice, and thus they now have little positive influence over their listeners. They should have shown a practical example, instead of saying one thing and doing another. This caused their advice to become ineffective. Muslims should strive to always act on their own advice before commanding others to do so, as behaving in this manner is hated by Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 61 Asaf, verse 3 Greatly hateful in the sight of Allah is that you say what you do not do.
This does not mean one must become perfect before advising others, as this is not possible. Instead, they should correct their intention and prove this through their actions by striving to act on their own advice before advising others. Only with this attitude will they avoid the punishment mentioned in this narration. The failure in acting on this principle has caused the advice of Muslims to become ineffective, even though the number of advisors has dramatically increased over the years. A simple life. Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, would dress in simple clothing like his predecessors. He was once in the marketplace where he was recognized by some of the merchants as the caliph. He then refused to purchase anything from them and instead bought a shirt for three silver coins from a boy who did not recognize him. The boy's father later came to Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, offering him a silver coin as a partial refund, claiming the shirt was worth only two silver coins. But Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, replied that he was happy with what he paid for, and the boy was happy with what he charged. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, did not allow people to show him favoritism when he was caliph. In addition, his attitude indicates the simple life he adopted. He also adopted a simple life in order to encourage others to do the same. A simple life encourages one to prioritize preparing for the hereafter over enjoying this material world. For example, when he was asked why he wore patched shirts, he replied that it was more humbling to the spiritual heart and an example for the believer to follow. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, pages 361 to 362. In a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 4118, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that simplicity is a part of faith. Islam does not teach Muslims to give up all their wealth and lawful desires, but it instead teaches them to adopt a simple lifestyle in all aspects of their life, such as their food, clothing, housing and business, so that it provides them free time to prepare for the hereafter adequately. This involves fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This simple life includes striving in this world in order to fulfill one's needs and the needs of their dependents without excessiveness, waste or extravagance. A Muslim should understand that the simpler life they lead, the less they will stress over worldly things and therefore the more they will be able to strive for the hereafter thereby, obtaining peace of mind, body and soul. But the more complicated a person's life is, the more they will stress, encounter difficulties and strive less for their hereafter, as their preoccupations with worldly things will never seem to end. This attitude will prevent them from obtaining peace of mind, body and soul. Simplicity leads to a life of ease in this world and a straightforward accounting on the day of judgment. Whereas, a complicated and indulgent life will only lead to a stressful life and a severe and difficult accounting on the day of judgment. Good Spending Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, did not place a brick on top of another brick, nor a stone over another stone, meaning he did not build homes for himself. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, page 363. In a narration found in Jami at Termidi, number 2482, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that all lawful spending gains reward from Allah, the Exalted, except the wealth which is spent on buildings. This includes all spending on lawful things, which is free from excessiveness, waste or extravagance. Spending on construction, which is necessary, is not included in this narration, but the construction which is beyond one's needs is. This is disliked as spending on construction easily leads to waste and extravagance. In addition, the one who spends wealth on construction is less likely to donate charity and spend in ways pleasing to Allah, the exalted. Also this behavior often leads a Muslim to adopt hopes for a long life, as the one who believes their stay in this world is extremely short will not waste energy and wealth on constructing a beautiful home. The greater one's hope for a long life, the less righteous deeds they will perform, believing they can always perform good deeds in the future. It also causes one to delay sincere repentance, believing they can always change for the better in the future. Finally, 
It causes one to dedicate more efforts to the world in order to create a more comfortable life for their supposed long stay in this world. Actively taking part in unnecessary construction occupies one's time which prevents them from performing voluntary righteous deeds, such as fasting and the voluntary night prayer out of extreme fatigue. It also prevents them from striving to gain and act on Islamic knowledge. Finally, in reality, taking part in unnecessary construction never ends. Meaning, the moment a person completes one part of their home, they move to the next until the cycle repeats itself. Therefore, Muslims should adhere to what is within their necessity in respect to all things, not just construction, so that they can avoid these negative consequences. Aspects of Asceticism Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once advised that asceticism had three parts, which has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, pages 365. The first aspect of asceticism is not possessing hopes for a long life. A great obstacle to the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, is having false hope for a long life. It is an extremely blameworthy characteristic, as it is the main cause for a Muslim giving priority to amassing the material world over preparing for the hereafter. One only needs to assess their average 24-hour day and observe how much time they dedicate to the material world and how much time they dedicate to the hereafter in order to realize this truth. In fact, having false hope for a long life is one of the strongest weapons the devil uses in order to misguide people. When a person believes they will live long, they delay preparing for the hereafter, falsely believing they can prepare for it in the near future. In most cases, this near future never comes and a person passes away without adequately preparing for the hereafter. In addition, false hope for a long life causes one to delay sincere repentance and changing one's character for the better as they believe they have much time left to do this. It encourages a person to hoard the things of this material world, such as wealth, as it convinces them they will need these things during their long life on earth. The devil scares people into thinking they must hoard wealth for their old age, as they may find no one to support them when they become physically weaker and therefore can no longer work for themselves. They forget that the same way Allah, the Exalted, took care of their provision when they were younger, He will provide for them in old age too. In fact, the provision of the creation was allocated over 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6748. It is strange how a person will dedicate 40 years of their life saving for their retirement, which very rarely lasts longer than 20 years, but fails to prepare in the same way for the eternal hereafter. Islam does not teach Muslims to not prepare anything for the world. There is no harm in saving for the near future, as long as priority is given to the hereafter. Even though, people admit they may die at any time yet, some behave as if they will live forever in this world. Even to the point that if they were given a promise of eternal life on earth, they would not be able to strive harder in order to accumulate more of the material world due to the restrictions of the day and night. How many people have passed away earlier than expected? And how many learn a lesson from this and change their behavior? In reality, one of the greatest pains a person will feel at the time of death or any other stage of the hereafter is regret for delaying their preparation for the hereafter. Chapter 63 al munafikan verses 10 to 11 And spend in the way of Allah from what we have provided you before death approaches one of you and he says, My Lord, if only you would delay me for a brief term so I would give charity and be of the righteous. But never will Allah delay a soul when its time has come. And Allah is aware of what you do. A person would be labeled a fool if they dedicated more time and wealth on a house which they were only going to live in for a short while, compared to a house they were planning to live in for a very long time. This is the example of giving priority to the temporal world over the eternal hereafter. Muslims should work for both the world and the hereafter, but know that death does not come to a person at a time, situation or age known to them, but it is certain to come. Therefore, preparing for it and what it leads to should take priority over preparing for a future in this world which is not certain to occur. 
The second aspect of asceticism is being grateful for the blessings one has been granted. A Muslim must ensure they fulfill all three aspects of gratitude so that they avoid becoming a denier of Allah, the exalted, as the one who is ungrateful in reality scorns the one who granted them the blessings. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 152 And be grateful to me and do not deny me. The three aspects of gratitude are to internally acknowledge Allah, the Exalted, as the sole creator and provider of all blessings. An aspect of this is to correct one's intention so that they only perform actions to please Allah, the Exalted. The next aspect is to praise Allah, the Exalted, via the tongue. And the final and highest aspect is to practically show gratitude through one's actions by using each blessing as prescribed by Islam in order to please Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 14 Ibrahim, verse 7 And remember when your Lord proclaimed, If you are grateful, I will surely increase you in favor, but if you deny indeed, my punishment is severe. As true gratitude leads to an increase in blessings, Muslims should fear that showing ingratitude may cause the blessings they possess to either be taken away from them or for their blessings to be used against them by becoming a burden and a curse for them in both worlds. It is important to note, even if a Muslim becomes truly grateful, they will still face tests and difficulties as they are guaranteed. But if they behave in the correct way, they will be guided through every situation so that they obtain peace of mind and body in this world and a great reward in the hereafter. The last aspect of asceticism is refraining from unlawful things. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1205, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the lawful and unlawful have been made clear by Islam. In between them are doubtful things which should be avoided in order to protect one's faith and honor. The vast majority of Muslims are aware of the obligatory duties and the majority of unlawful things, such as drinking alcohol. So these create no doubt within Muslims, therefore they should act accordingly. Meaning, fulfill the obligatory duties and abstain from the unlawful according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. All other things which are not obligatory and create a doubt in society should therefore be avoided. Allah, the Exalted, will not question why someone did not perform a voluntary deed, instead he will ask why they performed a voluntary deed. Therefore, leaving the voluntary action will have no consequences in the hereafter, whereas performing a voluntary deed will namely punishment, reward or forgiveness. It is important for Muslims to act on this short but extremely important narration, as it will solve and prevent many problems and debates. It is important to understand that when one indulges in doubtful or even vain things, it will take them one step closer to the unlawful. For example, sinful speech is often preceded by vain and useless speech. Therefore, it is much safer for a Muslim's faith and honor to avoid doubtful and vain things. Words of Wisdom Number 4 Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once advised the following pieces of advice, which has been recorded in Imam al-Asfahani's, Hiliyat al awliya number 157. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, advised that a person should only hope in Allah, the Exalted. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2459, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, Describe the difference between true hope in the mercy of Allah, the exalted, and wishful thinking. True hope is when one controls their soul by avoiding the disobedience of Allah, the exalted, and actively struggles for preparing for the hereafter. Whereas, the foolish wishful thinker follows their desires and then expects Allah, the exalted, to forgive them and fulfill their wishes. It is important for Muslims not to confuse these two attitudes so that they avoid living and dying as a wishful thinker, as this person is highly unlikely to succeed in this world or the next. Wishful thinking is like a farmer who fails to prepare the land for planting, fails to plant seeds, fails to water the land, and then expects to harvest a huge crop. This is plain foolishness, and this farmer is highly unlikely to succeed. Whereas, true hope is like a farmer who prepares the land, plants seeds, waters the land and then hopes Allah, the Exalted, will bless them with a huge harvest. The key difference is that the one who possesses true hope will actively strive to obey Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling his commands, 
refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And whenever they slip up, they sincerely repent. Whereas, the wishful thinker will not actively strive in obeying Allah, the Exalted, and instead follow their desires and still expect Allah, the Exalted, to forgive them and fulfill their wishes. Muslims must therefore learn the key difference so that they can abandon wishful thinking and instead adopt true hope in Allah, the Exalted, which always leads to nothing except good and success in both worlds. This has been indicated in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7405. A specific type of wishful thinking which affected the past nations and even the Muslim nation is when a person believes that they can ignore the commands and prohibitions of Allah, the Exalted, and somehow someone on the Day of Judgment will intercede for them and save them from hell. Even though the intercession of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is a fact and has been discussed in many narrations, such as the one found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 4308. Nonetheless, even with his intercession, some Muslims whose punishment will be reduced by it will still enter hell. Even a single moment in hell is truly unbearable. So one should abandon wishful thinking and instead adopt true hope by practically striving in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted. The devil convinces those who do not believe in Judgment Day that even if it occurs they will make peace with Allah, the Exalted, on that day by claiming that they were not so bad as they avoided major crimes such as murder. They have convinced themselves that their pleas will be accepted and they will be sent to paradise even though they disbelieved in Allah, the Exalted, during their lives on earth. This is incredibly foolish, as Allah, the Exalted, will not treat the person who believed in him and tried to obey him like the one who disbelieved in him. A single verse has erased this type of wishful thinking. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 85 And whoever desires other than Islam as religion, never will it be accepted from him, and he in the hereafter will be among the losers. The next thing Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, advised, is that a person should not fear anything except their sins. Sins have been classified as minor and major. Over time, many definitions have been given regarding what exactly a major sin is. One simple classification is that any sin which Islam has commanded the Islamic government to punish is classed as a major sin. Another classification is that if any sin is mentioned with hellfire, the anger of Allah, the Exalted, or the curse of Allah, the Exalted, then it is a major sin. For example, backbiting is a major sin as it is cursed in the Holy Quran. Chapter 104 Al-Humazah, verse 1 Woe to every backbiter, slanderer. Some Muslims believe there are only seven major sins which have been mentioned in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari number 2766. But they fail to realize that even though these seven are major sins, it does not mean that they are only seven. In fact, there are other narrations which mention other major sins such as disobeying parents. This narration is found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6273. The seven major sins declared in the narration quoted earlier are polytheism, magic, killing an innocent, dealing with financial interest, usurping the wealth of orphans, fleeing a battlefield and accusing an innocent woman of fornication. It is important to note that when one persists on minor sins, they become major in the sight of Islam. Major sins are only forgiven with sincere repentance, whereas minor sins can be erased by avoiding the major sins and performing righteous deeds. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 31. If you avoid the major sins which you are forbidden, we will remove from you your lesser sins. Sincere repentance includes regret, seeking the forgiveness of Allah, the Exalted, and anyone who has been wronged, making a firm promise not to commit the same or similar sin again, and making up for any rights which have been violated in respect to Allah, the Exalted, and people. Muslims should ensure they avoid all types of sins irrespective of size, as one of the traps of the devil is that he inspires Muslims to disregard small sins. One should always remember that mountains are made up of small stones. The next thing Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, advised, is that a person should not feel embarrassed to admit that they do not know something. Some have adopted a strange attitude. 
When they are questioned about things they are unaware of, instead of admitting the truth, they give a reply which has little or no foundation in the truth. This can become a serious issue, especially in matters connected to Islam. A Muslim may get punished for giving incorrect information which others act on. This has been indicated in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 2351. This is because they ignorantly attributed things to Allah, the Exalted, or the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Because of these people, strange beliefs and customs have become attached to Islam, which is a great deviation from the truth brought by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. In fact, many of the cultural customs Muslims have adopted, believing them to be a part of Islam, occurred because of this ignorant mentality. These people believe that if they simply admit they do not know something, they will appear foolish to others. This mentality in itself is extremely foolish, as the righteous predecessors would stress the importance of admitting one's ignorance, so that others do not become misguided. In fact, the righteous predecessors would only count the person who behaved in this manner as an intelligent person, and counted the one who answered every question posed to them a fool. This attitude is often observed in elders who often advise their children on issues relating to the world and religion, instead of admitting their ignorance and directing them to someone who knows the truth. When elders act in this way, they fail their duty in rightly guiding their dependents, which has been indicated in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2928. Muslims should therefore gain correct knowledge, whether worldly or religious, before advising others and in cases they are unaware of something they should admit it, as this will not reduce their rank in any way. If anything Allah, the exalted, and people will appreciate their honesty, the next thing Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, advised, is that patience is to faith like the head is to the body, and there is nothing good in a body which has no head. A narration found in Musnad Ahmad, number 2803, advises that being patient over the things one dislikes leads to a great reward. Chapter 39 as Zuma, verse 10. Indeed, the patient will be given their reward without account, i.e., limit. Patience is a key element required in order to fulfill the three aspects of faith, fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny. But a higher and more rewarding level than patience is contentment. This is when a Muslim deeply believes that Allah, the Exalted, only chooses the best for His servants and they therefore prefer His choice over their own. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 but perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. A patient Muslim understands that anything which affected them, such as a difficulty, could not have been avoided even if the entire creation aided them. Similarly, whatever missed them could not have affected them. The one who truly accepts this fact will not exult and grow proud over anything they obtain knowing Allah, the Exalted, allocated that thing to them. Nor will they grieve over anything which they fail to obtain, knowing Allah, the Exalted, did not allocate that thing to them, and nothing in existence can alter this fact. Chapter 57 Al-Hadid, verses 22 to 23. No disaster strikes upon the earth or among yourselves, except that it is in a register one before we bring it into being. Indeed that for Allah is easy. In order that you not despair over what has eluded you, and not exult in pride over what he has given you. In addition, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has advised in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 79, that when something occurs a Muslim should firmly believe it was decreed and nothing could have changed the outcome. And a Muslim should not have regrets believing they could have prevented the outcome if they somehow behaved differently as this attitude only causes the devil to encourage them towards impatience and complaining about destiny. A patient Muslim truly understands that whatever Allah, the Exalted, has chosen is best for them, even if they do not observe the wisdom behind it. The one who is patient does desire a change in their situation, and even supplicates for it, but they do not complain about what has occurred. Being persistently patient can lead a Muslim to a greater level namely, contentment.
The one who is content does not desire things to change, as they know the choice of Allah, the exalted, is better than their choice. This Muslim firmly believes an ACTS on the narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 7500. It advises that every situation is best for the believer. If they encounter a problem, they should show patience, which leads to blessings. And if they experience times of ease, they should show gratitude, which also leads to blessings. It is important to know that Allah, the Exalted, tests those He loves. If they show patience, they will be rewarded, but if they are angered, it only proves their lack of love for Allah, the Exalted. This is confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2396. A Muslim should be patient or content with the choice and decree of Allah, the Exalted, in both times of ease and hardship. This will reduce one's distress and provide them with much blessings in both worlds. Whereas, impatience will only destroy the reward they could have received. Either way, a Muslim will go through the situation decreed by Allah, the Exalted, but it is their choice whether they desire reward or not. A Muslim will never reach full contentment until their behavior is equal in times of difficulty and ease. How can a true servant go to the master namely, Allah, the Exalted, for a judgment, and then become unhappy if the choice does not match their desire? There is a real possibility that if a person gets what they desire, it will destroy them. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. A Muslim should not worship Allah, the Exalted, on the edge. Meaning, when the Divine Decree matches their wishes they praise Allah, the Exalted. And when it does not they become annoyed acting as if they know better than Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 22 Al-Hajj, verse 11 And of the people is he who worships Allah on an edge. If he is touched by good he is reassured by it, but if he is struck by trial he turns on his face to unbelief. He has lost this world and the hereafter. That is what is the manifest loss. A Muslim should behave with the choice of Allah, the Exalted, as if they would behave with a skilled, trustworthy doctor. The same way a Muslim would not complain, taking bitter medicine prescribed by the doctor, knowing it is best for them, they should accept the difficulties they face in the world, knowing it is best for them. In fact, a sensible person would thank the doctor for the bitter medicine, and similarly, an intelligent Muslim would thank Allah, the Exalted, for any situation they encounter. In addition, a Muslim should review the many verses of the Holy Quran and the narrations of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, which discuss the reward given to the patient and content Muslim. Deep reflection on this will inspire a Muslim to remain steadfast when facing difficulties. For example, chapter 39 as Zuma, verse 10. Indeed, the patient will be given their reward without account, i.e., limit. Another example is mentioned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2402. It advises that when those who patiently face trials and difficulties in the world receive their reward on Judgment Day, those who did not face such trials will wish they patiently face difficulties such as their skin being cut off with scissors. In order to gain patience and even contentment with what Allah, the Exalted, chooses for a person, they should seek and act on the knowledge found within the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, so that they reach the high level of excellence of faith. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 99. Excellence in faith is when a Muslim performs deeds, such as the prayer, as if they can witness Allah, the Exalted. The one who reaches this level will not feel the pain of difficulties and trials, as they will completely be immersed in the awareness and love of Allah, the Exalted. This is similar to the state of the women who did not feel pain when cutting their own hands when they observed the beauty of the Holy Prophet Yusuf, peace be upon him. Chapter 12 Yusuf, verse 31 And gave each one of them a knife and said to Joseph, Come out before them. And when they saw him, they greatly admired him and cut their hands and said, Perfect is Allah. This is not a man, this is none but a noble angel. If a Muslim cannot reach this high level of faith, they should at least try to reach the lower level mentioned in the narration quoted earlier. 
This is the level where one is constantly aware they are being observed by Allah, the Exalted. The same way a person would not complain in front of an authoritative figure they feared, such as an employer, a Muslim who is constantly aware of the presence of Allah, the Exalted, will not complain about the choices he makes. Increasing Blessings Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once advised that blessings are connected to gratitude and gratitude leads to more blessings. They are attached to one another, so more blessings from Allah, the Exalted, will not stop coming unless gratitude from the person ceases. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, page 383. Gratitude involves using the blessings one has been granted in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. In reality, in most cases nothing in this material world in itself is good or bad, such as wealth. What makes a thing good or bad is the way it is used. It is important to understand that the very purpose of everything which was created by Allah, the Exalted, was for it to be used correctly according to the teachings of Islam. When something is not used correctly, it in reality becomes useless. For example, wealth is useful in both worlds when it is used correctly, such as being spent on the necessities of a person and their dependents. But it can become useless and even a curse for its bearer if it is not used correctly, such as being hoarded or spent on sinful things. Simply hoarding wealth causes wealth to lose value. How can paper and metal coins one tucks away be useful? In this respect, there is no difference between a blank piece of paper and a note of money. It is only useful when it is used correctly. So if a Muslim desires all their worldly possessions to become a blessing for them in both worlds, all they have to do is use them correctly according to the teachings found in the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. But if they use them incorrectly, then the same blessing will become a burden and curse for them in both worlds. It is as simple as that. One can adopt the correct attitude when they understand the purpose of these blessings. Every worldly blessing a Muslim possesses is only a means which should aid them in reaching the hereafter safely. It is not an end in itself. For example, wealth is a means one should use in order to obey Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, fulfilling their necessities and the necessities of their dependents. It is not an end or an ultimate goal in itself. This not only aids a Muslim in maintaining their focus on the hereafter, but it also aids them whenever they lose worldly blessings. When a Muslim treats each worldly blessing, such as a child, as a means to please Allah, the Exalted, and reach the hereafter safely, then losing it will not have such a detrimental impact on them. They may become sad, which is an acceptable emotion, but they will not become grieved, which leads to impatience and other mental problems, such as depression. This is because they firmly believe the worldly blessing they possessed was only a means, so losing it does not cause a loss in the ultimate goal namely, paradise, the loss of which is disastrous. Therefore, still possessing and concentrating on the ultimate goal will prevent them from becoming grieved. In addition, they will understand that just like the thing they lost was only a means they firmly believe, they will be provided with another means to reach and fulfill their ultimate goal by Allah, the Exalted. This will also prevent them from grieving. Whereas, the one who believes their worldly blessing is the end instead of a means will experience severe grief when losing it as their whole purpose and objective has been lost. This grief will lead to depression and other mental issues. To conclude, Muslims should treat each blessing they possess as a means to reach the hereafter safely, not as an end in itself. This is how one can possess things without being possessed by them. This is how they can keep worldly things in their hands and not in their hearts. A beautiful sermon, number two. Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, would give elegant, precise and useful sermons to the public, urging them towards success and peace in both worlds. The following sermon has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, volume 1, page 391. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him advised the people that the nations before them were destroyed when the general public committed sins, and the devoted scholars and rabbis did not forbid them from it. Therefore, the people must command good and forbid evil before they are punished like those before them were. He concluded, 
that commanding good and forbidding evil does not stop one's provision from reaching them, nor does it bring one's death closer to them. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2686, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that failing to fulfill the important duty of commanding good and forbidding evil can be understood with the example of a boat with two levels full of people. The people on the lower level keep disturbing the people on the upper level whenever they desire to access water. So they decide to drill a hole in the lower level so that they can access water directly. If the people on the upper level fail to stop them, they will all surely drown. It is important for Muslims to never give up commanding good and forbidding evil according to their knowledge in a gentle way. A Muslim should never believe that as long as they obey Allah, the exalted, other misguided people will not be able to affect them in a negative way. A good apple will eventually get affected when placed with rotten apples. Similarly, the Muslim who fails to command others to do good will eventually be affected by their negative behavior, whether it is subtle or apparent. Even if the wider society has become heedless, one should never give up advising their dependents such as their family, as not only will their negative behavior affect them more, but this is a duty on all Muslims, according to a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2928. Even if a Muslim is ignored by others, they should discharge their duty by persistently advising them in a gentle way, which is supported by strong evidence and knowledge. Only in this way will they be protected from their negative effects and pardoned on the day of judgment. But if they only care about themselves and ignore the actions of others, it is feared that the negative effects of others may well lead to their eventual misguidance. Consulting the wise Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, would urge others to always consult the wise in their affairs. For example, he once advised that consultation is the essence of guidance. The one who bases their actions on their own opinions without consulting others is in grave danger. On another occasion, he commented that seeking consultation was a great support, and an aspect of bad preparation is failing to consult someone. He once advised someone to not consult a miser, as they will advise others to fear poverty and forbid others from being generous. They should not consult a coward, as they will weaken the resolve of others. They should not consult someone who is covetous, as they will encourage others to accumulate things by unjust means. He once advised that the best people one can consult are people of reason and knowledge and people of experience and resolve. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, page 393 and 628. Muslims should only consult a few people in respect to their affairs. They should select these few people according to the advice of the Holy Quran. Chapter 16 and now, verse 43. So, ask the people of the message if you do not know. This verse reminds Muslims to consult those who possess knowledge. As consulting an ignorant person only leads to further trouble. Just like a person would be foolish to consult a car mechanic over their physical health, a Muslim should only consult those who possess knowledge about it and the Islamic teachings linked to them. In addition, a Muslim should only consult those who fear Allah, the Exalted. This is because they will never advise others to disobey Allah, the Exalted. Whereas, those who do not fear or obey Allah, the Exalted, might possess knowledge and experience, but they will easily advise others to disobey Allah, the Exalted, which only increases one's problems. In reality, those who fear Allah, the Exalted, possess true knowledge and only this knowledge will guide others through their problems successfully. Chapter 35 Fatir, verse 28 only those fear Allah from among his servants who have knowledge. Under your care. Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once advised his governor in Egypt to only appoint people to leadership roles based on their qualifications and not on the basis of favoritism or preference. Appointing people to official positions on the basis of favoritism is injustice and an act of betraying Allah, the exalted, and it causes great harm to the people. For positions of authority, he should choose people who were pious, dignified, knowledgeable, and kind. 
He should ensure that they were experienced, intelligent and modest people from righteous families who were religiously committed because they are the noblest in attitude and more careful in protecting themselves from error. They are far from greed and are more aware of the consequences of things than others. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, pages 393 to 394. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2409, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that each person is a guardian and responsible for the things under their care. The greatest thing a Muslim is a guardian of is their faith. Therefore, they must strive to fulfill its responsibility by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This guardianship also includes every blessing one has been granted by Allah, the Exalted, which includes external things such as wealth and internal things such as one's body. A Muslim must fulfill the responsibility of these things by using them in the way prescribed by Islam. For example, a Muslim should only use their eyes to look at lawful things and their tongue to utter only lawful and useful words. This guardianship also extends to others within one's life such as relatives and friends. A Muslim must fulfill this responsibility by fulfilling their rights such as providing for them and gently commanding good and forbidding evil according to the teachings of Islam. One should not cut off from others, especially over worldly issues. Instead, they should continue to treat them kindly, hoping they will change for the better. This guardianship includes one's children. A Muslim must guide them by leading by example, as this by far is the most effective way in guiding children. They must obey Allah, the Exalted, practically as discussed earlier, and teach their children to do the same. To conclude, according to this narration, everyone has some sort of responsibility they have been entrusted with. So they should gain and act on the relevant knowledge in order to fulfill them, as this is a part of obeying Allah, the Exalted. Holding to Justice Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once lost his shield and found it in the possession of a Jew who claimed it was his. The case was taken to a Muslim judge who asked Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, to bring witnesses to testify the shield was his. When he named his sons as witnesses, the judge refused to accept their testimony, as a son, in this type of legal case, cannot testify on behalf of his father. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, commented that his sons were the leaders of the youth of paradise, yet the judge would not accept their testimony. The judge ruled in favor of the Jew. The Jewish man was astonished how the Muslim judge ruled against the Caliph of the Muslims, and as a result, he accepted Islam and returned the shield back to Ali, may Allah be pleased with him. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, refrained from taking the shield back as the judge had ruled it belonged to the Jewish man. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, also gave the man a horse as a gift. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, page 395. One of the major reasons why society seems to be digressing is because people have abandoned acting justly. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once warned in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6787, that previous nations were destroyed as the authorities would punish the weak when they broke the law, but would pardon the rich and influential. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, being the head of state even declared in this narration that if his own daughter committed a crime, he would enforce the full legal punishment on her. Even though members of the general public might not be in a position to advise their leaders to remain just in their actions, but they can influence them indirectly by acting justly in all their dealings and actions. For example, a Muslim must act justly in respect to their dependents, such as their children, by treating them equally. This has been specifically advised in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 3544. They should act justly in all their business dealings irrespective of who they deal with. If people act with justice on an individual level, then communities can change for the better and in turn those who are in influential positions, such as politicians, will act justly whether they desire to or not. Equality 
Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, would give equal sums of wealth from the public treasury to the people irrespective of their social status, ethnicity, gender or anything else. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, page 398. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6543, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Allah, the Exalted, does not judge people based on their outward appearance or their wealth. Instead he observes and judges people's inward intention and their physical actions. The first thing to note is that a Muslim should always correct their intention when performing any deed as Allah, the Exalted, will only reward them when they perform righteous deeds for his sake. Those who perform deeds for the sake of other people and things will be told to gain their reward from those who they acted for on Judgment Day, which will not be possible. This has been warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3154. In addition, this narration indicates the importance of equality in Islam. A person is not superior to others by worldly things such as their ethnicity or wealth. Even though, many Muslims have erected these barriers, such as social castes and sex thereby believing some are better than others, Islam has clearly rejected this concept and declared that in this respect all people are equal in the sight of Islam. The only thing which makes one Muslim superior to another is their piety meaning how much they fulfill the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refrain from his prohibitions and face destiny with patience. Chapter 49 Al-Hajarat, verse 13 Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. A Muslim should therefore busy themselves in obeying Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling his rights and the rights of people, and not believe that something they possess or belong to will somehow save them from punishment. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has made it clear in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6853, that the Muslim who lacks in righteous deeds meaning the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, will not be increased in rank because of their lineage. In reality, this applies to all worldly things such as wealth, ethnicity, gender or social brotherhoods and castes. Types of Knowledge Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once advised that they were three types of knowledge. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, page 408. The first type is knowledge of Allah, the Exalted. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2736, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that whoever knows the 99 names of Allah, the Exalted, will enter paradise. Knowing does not only refer to memorizing them. It actually means to study them and act on them according to one's status and potential. For example, Allah, the Exalted, is the most merciful according to his infinite status. This attribute means that Allah, the Exalted, bestows countless favors on the creation and is always extremely kind to them. This same characteristic has been attributed to others such as the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 9 at Torba, verse 128. There has certainly come to you a messenger from among yourselves. Grievous to him is what you suffer, he is concerned over you, i.e. your guidance and to the believers is kind and merciful. When used in reference to the creation, merciful means soft-hearted and compassionate. Similarly, Allah, the Exalted, is all-forgiving according to his infinite status. And adopting this attribute by forgiving others is something which has been encouraged in Islam. Chapter 24 and Nur, verse 22. And let them pardon and overlook. Would you not like that Allah should forgive you? So the divine attributes of Allah, the Exalted, can be adopted by Muslims according to their status. Therefore, Muslims must first understand the meaning of the divine attributes and names, and then adopt the meaning of the names in their character through action, until they become firmly rooted into their spiritual heart, so that they can achieve noble character. The second and third types are knowledge of what Allah, the Exalted, loves and knowledge of what he hates. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2645, that when Allah, the Exalted, desires to give someone good, he provides them with Islamic knowledge. 
There is no doubt that every Muslim, irrespective of the strength of their faith, desires good in both worlds. Even though many Muslims incorrectly believe that this good which they desire lies in fame, wealth, authority, companionship, and their career, this narration makes it crystal clear that true lasting good lies in gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge. It is important to note a branch of religious knowledge is useful, worldly knowledge, whereby one earns lawful provision in order to fulfill their necessities and the necessities of their dependents. Even though the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has pointed out where good lies, yet it is a shame how many Muslims do not place much value in this. They in most cases only strive to obtain the bare minimum of Islamic knowledge in order to fulfill their obligatory duties and fail to acquire and act on more such as the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Instead they dedicate their efforts on worldly things believing true good is found there. Many Muslims fail to appreciate that the righteous predecessors had to journey for weeks on end just to learn a single verse or narration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, whereas today one can study Islamic teachings without leaving their home. Yet, many fail to make use of this blessing given to the modern-day Muslims. Out of His infinite mercy Allah, the Exalted, through His Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has not only pointed out where true good lies, but He has also placed this good at one's fingertips. Allah, the Exalted, has informed mankind of where an eternal buried treasure is located, which can solve all the problems they may encounter in both worlds. But Muslims will only obtain this good once they struggle to acquire and act on it. A beautiful sermon number three. Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, would give elegant, precise and useful sermons to the public, urging them towards success and peace in both worlds. The following sermon has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, volume one, pages 409 to 410. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, advised the people to fear Allah, the Exalted. Piety, fearing Allah, the Exalted, cannot be achieved without gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge so that one can fulfill the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refrain from his prohibitions and face destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 35 Fatir, verse 28 only those fear Allah from among his servants who have knowledge. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2451, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon, advised that a Muslim cannot become pious until they avoid something which is not harmful to their religion, out of caution that it will lead to something which is harmful. Therefore, an aspect of piety is to avoid things which are doubtful, not just unlawful. This is because doubtful things takes a Muslim one step closer to the unlawful, and the closer one is to the unlawful, the easier it is to fall into it. It is why a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1205, advises that the one who avoids unlawful and doubtful things will protect their religion and honor. If one observes those who have become misguided in society, in most cases, this occurred gradually, not in one sudden step. Meaning, the person first indulged in doubtful things before falling into the unlawful. This is the reason why Islam stresses the need to avoid unnecessary and vain things in one's life, as they can lead them to the unlawful. For example, vain and useless speech which is not classified sinful by Islam often leads to evil speech, such as backbiting, lying and slander. If a person avoids the first step by not indulging in vain speech, they will undoubtedly avoid evil speech. This process can be applied to all things which are vain, unnecessary, and especially, doubtful. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised the people to fear Allah, the Exalted, who set a specific time for them on this earth. He warned them to hasten towards doing good deeds before death, the destroyer of pleasures, reaches them. Death is something which is certain to occur, but the time is unknown. So it therefore makes sense that a Muslim who believes in the hereafter prioritizes preparing for it, over preparing for things which might not occur, such as marriage, children, or their retirement. It is strange how many Muslims have adopted the opposite mentality, even though they testify that the world is temporary and uncertain, whereas the hereafter is permanent, and they are certain to reach it. No matter how one behaves, they will be judged regarding their deeds. A Muslim should not be fooled into believing that they can and will prepare for the hereafter in the future, 
as this attitude only causes them to delay further until their death occurs and they leave this world with regrets that will not aid them. So the important thing is not that people will die, as this is unavoidable, but the key is acting in such a way that one is fully prepared for it. The only way to prepare for it correctly is by acting on the teachings of Islam, namely, fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This is only possible when one prioritizes preparing for the hereafter over preparing for things which might not occur. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised the people to fear Allah, the Exalted, who gave them hearing to understand what they need to understand. Listening correctly to the word of Allah, the Exalted, is the only way one can correctly adhere to its teachings. It is important to understand the difference between hearing and listening. Hearing is simply acknowledging a sound with one's mind, even if they fail to make sense of the noise. For example, a person may hear someone shouting at them from a great distance, but they will not be able to understand what they are saying. Whereas, listening involves hearing a sound and understanding it so that one's behavior changes. For example, a person giving a specific verbal instruction to another who responds appropriately after hearing and understanding the instructions. Muslims need to hear the word of Allah, the Exalted, and strive to understand it so that it affects their behavior in a positive way. Unfortunately, many Muslims have failed to live up to this in respect to the Holy Quran as they are good at hearing the recitation of the Holy Quran, but fail to correctly listen to it which involves understanding and acting on its teachings. To conclude, simply hearing the word of Allah, the Exalted, is not good enough to obtain success, one must strive to instead truly listen to it. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised the people to fear Allah, the Exalted, who gave them sight to see the things around them. It is important for a Muslim to be observant in their daily life and avoid being too self-absorbed in their own worldly matters so that they become heedless over the things which are occurring around them and the things which have already occurred. This is an important quality to possess as it is an excellent way to strengthen one's faith, which in turn helps one to remain obedient to Allah, the Exalted, at all times. For example, when a Muslim observes a sick person, they should not only aid them by whatever means they possess, even if it is only a supplication, but they should reflect on their own health and understand that they too will eventually lose their good health, either by an illness, aging or even death. This should inspire them to be grateful for their good health, and show this through their actions by taking advantage of their good health in both worldly and religious matters which are pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. When they observe the death of a rich person, they should not only feel sad for the deceased and their family, but realize that one day, which is unknown to them, they will die also. They should understand that just like the rich person was abandoned by their wealth, fame and family at their grave, so will they too be left only with their deeds in their grave. This will encourage them to prepare for their grave and the hereafter. This attitude can and should be applied to all things one observes. A Muslim should learn a lesson from everything around them, which has been advised in the Holy Quran. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 191 And give thought to the creation of the heavens and the earth, saying, Our Lord, you did not create this aimlessly. Exalted are you above such a thing, then protect us from the punishment of the fire. Those who behave in this manner will strengthen their faith on a daily basis, whereas those who are too self-absorbed in their worldly life will remain heedless, which may lead them to their destruction. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised the people to fear Allah, the Exalted, who gave them hearts and minds to understand things. It is important for Muslims to develop the correct perception so that they can increase their obedience to Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This is what the righteous predecessors possessed, and it encouraged them to avoid the excess luxuries of the material world and instead prepare for the hereafter. This is an important characteristic to possess, and it can be explained with a worldly example. Two people are extremely thirsty and come across a cup of murky water. They both desire to drink it, even though it is not pure, and even if it means they have to argue over it. As their thirst grows the more focused on the cup of murky water they become, to the point they lose focus on everything else. 
But if one of them shifted their focus and observed a river of pure water which was only a short distance ahead, they would immediately lose focus on the cup of water to the point they would no longer care about it and no longer argue over it. And instead they would endure their thirst patiently knowing a river of pure water is close. The person who is unaware of the river would probably believe the other person is crazy after observing their change in attitude. This is the case of the two types of people in this world. One group greedily focuses on the material world. The other group has shifted their focus to the hereafter and the pure and eternal blessings therein. When one shifts their focus to the bliss of the hereafter, worldly problems do not seem like such a big deal. Therefore, patience becomes easier to adopt. But if one keeps their focus on this world, then it will seem like everything to them. They will argue, fight, love and hate for it. Just like the person in the example mentioned earlier, who only focuses on the cup of murky water. This correct perception is only achieved through gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge found within the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 41 Fusilat, verse 53 We will show them our signs in the horizons and within themselves until it becomes clear to them that it is the truth. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised the people that they were not created in vain. The Holy Quran clearly declared the purpose of mankind in chapter 51, Ad Dariat, verse 56. And I did not create the jinn and mankind except to worship me. Before one can worship Allah, the Exalted, they must first recognize him, as it is not possible to obey someone without knowledge. In addition, people must first learn how to worship Allah, the Exalted, before they can fulfill this task. Therefore, worship is followed by knowledge. This is why in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 224, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, declared seeking useful knowledge a duty on all Muslims. Without knowledge, one will never be able to worship Allah, the Exalted, correctly. Few good deeds performed with knowledge are far superior to many good deeds performed incorrectly because of ignorance. As Allah, the Exalted, is the one who created mankind, no one has the right to be served and worshipped except Him. If an employer easily dismisses their employee for abandoning the duty they have been hired for, how can it be correct to abandon serving and worshipping Allah, the Exalted, when He alone created and sustains the creation? All of mankind have been granted free will and the ability to obey and worship Allah, the Exalted. So each person must decide whether they desire to fulfill their purpose of creation, thereby receiving eternal reward or reject it, and face punishment in both worlds. The same way a device, such as a mobile phone, which does not fulfill its primary purpose is discarded, people may well be discarded on the day of judgment into hell for failing to fulfill their primary purpose of existence. It is important to note that worship refers to the obedience of Allah, the Exalted. This involves fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. This obedience must encompass every part of one's life and body, such as their tongue. It includes a person's duty towards Allah, the Exalted, such as offering the prayer and treating the creation with kindness. Those who obey Allah, the Exalted, will be given the best rewards while those who disobey him will receive the worst punishment in this world and the next. In a divine narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2466, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, narrates from Allah, the Exalted, who declares that if one busies themselves in worshipping him through sincere obedience, he will fill their heart with richness and remove their poverty. But if they turn away from his worship and obedience, Allah, the Exalted, will fill their life with problems and not remove their poverty. It is important to note that Allah, the Exalted, does not need the creation in any way whatsoever. As clearly mentioned in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6572, people only benefit themselves with their good deeds as it raises their ranks. And they only harm themselves with their sins as they will be held accountable for them. The infinite status of Allah, the Exalted, does not change at all irrespective of if the entire creation worshipped him or not. 
Allah, the Exalted, is the sole creator and sole provider. It is people who are completely and utterly in need of Him. Whoever understands this and sincerely obeys Allah, the Exalted, will fulfill the purpose of their creation and will therefore be given an eternal reward. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised the people that Allah, the Exalted, had promised them reward for obeying him during times of ease and hardship. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 7500, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that every situation is blessed for a believer. The only condition is that they need to respond to each situation they encounter while obeying Allah, the Exalted, specifically, patience in difficulties and gratitude in times of ease. There are two aspects of life. One aspect are the situations people find themselves in, whether they are times of ease or difficulties. The control of what situation a person faces is out of their hands. Allah, the Exalted, has decided this and there is no escaping them. Therefore, stressing over the situations one faces does not make sense, as they are destined and therefore inevitable. The other aspect is a person's reaction to each situation. This is in each person's control, and this is what they are judged on for example, showing patience or impatience in a difficult situation. Therefore, a Muslim must concentrate on their behavior and reaction in each situation, instead of stressing over being in a situation, as this is unavoidable. If a Muslim desires to succeed in both worlds, they should assess each situation and always act in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted. For example, in times of ease they must use the blessings they possess as prescribed by Islam, which is true gratitude to Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 14 Ibrahim, verse 7 And remember when your Lord proclaimed, If you are grateful, I will surely increase you in favor. And in times of difficulty, they must show patience, knowing Allah, the Exalted, chooses what is best for His servants, even if they do not understand the wisdom behind the choices. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. Aspects of Piety Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once mentioned some aspects of piety. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, page 426. The first aspect of piety mentioned by Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, is fearing Allah, the Exalted. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2451, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon advise that a Muslim cannot become pious until they avoid something which is not harmful to their religion, out of caution that it will lead to something which is harmful. Piety can be summed up to mean fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This includes treating others how one desires to be treated by people. An aspect of piety is to avoid things which are doubtful, not just unlawful. This is because doubtful things take a Muslim one step closer to the unlawful. And the closer one is to the unlawful, the easier it is to fall into it. It is why a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1205, advises that the one who avoids unlawful and doubtful things and only uses lawful things will protect their religion and honor. If one observes those who have become misguided in society, in most cases, it occurred gradually, not in one sudden step. Meaning, the person first indulged in doubtful things before falling into the unlawful. This is the reason why Islam stresses the need to avoid unnecessary and vain things in one's life, as they can lead them to the unlawful. For example, vain and useless speech meaning, speech which derives no benefit, nor is it a sin, often leads to evil speech such as backbiting, lying and slander. If a person avoided the first step by not indulging in vain speech, they would avoid evil speech. This process can be applied to all things which are vain, unnecessary, and especially, doubtful. Therefore, a Muslim should strive to adopt piety as described earlier, a branch of which is to avoid vain and doubtful things out of fear they will lead to the unlawful. The second aspect of piety mentioned by Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, is acting according to divine revelation. 
This includes both the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim number 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards the Holy Quran and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Sincerity towards the Holy Quran includes having deep respect and love for the words of Allah, the Exalted. This sincerity is proven when one fulfills the three aspects of the Holy Quran. The first is to recite it correctly and regularly. The second is to understand its teachings through a reliable source and teacher. The final aspect is to act on the teachings of the Holy Quran with the aim of pleasing Allah, the Exalted. The sincere Muslim gives priority to acting on its teachings over acting on their desires which contradict the Holy Quran. Modeling one's character on the Holy Quran is the sign of true sincerity towards the Book of Allah, the Exalted. This is the tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, which is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 1342. The next thing mentioned in the main narration under discussion is sincerity towards the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This includes striving to acquire knowledge in order to act on his traditions. These traditions include the ones related to Allah, the Exalted, in the form of worship and his blessed noble character towards the creation. Chapter 68 al kalam verse 4 And indeed you are of a great moral character. It includes to accept his commands and prohibitions at all times. This has been made a duty by Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 59 Al-Hash verse 7 And whatever the Messenger has given you, take and what he has forbidden you, refrain from. Sincerity includes to give priority to his traditions over the actions of anyone else, as all paths to Allah, the Exalted, are closed except the path of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 3 Ali Imran verse 31 Say, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. If you should love Allah then follow me, so Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. One must love all those who supported him during his life and after his passing, whether they are from his family or his companions, may Allah be pleased with them all. Supporting those who walk on his path and teach his traditions is a duty on those who desire to be sincere to him. Sincerity also includes loving those who love him and disliking those who criticize him irrespective of one's relationship with these people. This is all summarized in a single narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 16. It advises that a person cannot have true faith until they love Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, more than the entire creation. This love must be shown through actions not just words. The third aspect of piety mentioned by Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, is being content with little in this world. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2305, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the richest person is the one who is satisfied with what Allah, the Exalted, has granted them. The one who is always in need of more worldly things is needy, which is another word for poor, even if they possess much wealth. But the one who is pleased with what they possess is not needy and is therefore rich even if they possess little wealth or worldly things. In addition, the one who is pleased with what Allah, the Exalted, has granted them will be provided with grace which will ensure their possessions fulfill their needs and the needs of their dependents and it will grant them peace of mind and body. Whereas, those who are not pleased will not obtain this grace which will cause them to feel as if their possessions are not enough to fulfill their needs and the needs of their dependents. This will prevent them from obtaining peace of mind and body. Satisfaction includes being pleased with what Allah, the Exalted, has chosen for a person namely, destiny. A Muslim should firmly believe Allah, the Exalted, always chooses what is best for his servant, even if they do not observe the wisdom behind the choice. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. If a Muslim concentrates on obeying Allah, the Exalted, in every situation such as patience in times of difficulty and gratitude in times of ease, they will be provided with peace of mind. 
The final aspect of piety mentioned by Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, is practically preparing for death. It is strange that even though people believe they can die at any moment yet, the vast majority behave as if they will live a long life. Some dedicate their efforts to this material world to such a degree that even if they were guaranteed a long life, they could not exert any more effort for the sake of the material world. Unfortunately, Muslims delay preparing for the hereafter, believing they can do it in the future. They often keep delaying this preparation until they suddenly encounter death unprepared. It is important for Muslims to understand that no matter how long they live, life goes by in a flash. So they should take every opportunity they have in order to prepare for the eternal hereafter. This does not mean they should abandon the world completely. It means they should prioritize preparing for the hereafter by only taking what they need from the material world in order to fulfill their necessities and responsibilities according to the commands of Allah, the Exalted. This attitude will allow them to enjoy the lawful pleasures of this world and prepare adequately for the next one also. A Muslim only fails preparing for the hereafter correctly because of their pursuit of the excess of this material world, not by striving to fulfill their necessities and responsibilities. A Muslim should remember the narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 7424, which warns that only a person's deeds will accompany them in their grave while their family and wealth abandons them at this crucial moment. Therefore, a Muslim should give priority to the thing which will aid them in their moment of need. Muslims should not delay preparing for the hereafter, otherwise they may well encounter death suddenly while unprepared, as death does not come at a particular age or time. If they fail to prepare, they will be left with nothing but regrets at a time when regrets will not benefit them. Chapter 89 Al-Fajr, verse 23 And brought within view that day is hell, that day man will remember but how i.e. what good to him will be the remembrance. The Divine Decree Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once commented that nothing happens on earth until it is decreed in heaven. There is no one who does not have two angels appointed to defend them and take care of them until what Allah, the Exalted, has decreed comes to them, whereupon they no longer stand between them and what is decreed for them. No one knows true faith until they realize that what befalls them could never have missed them and what missed them could never have befallen them. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, page 428. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, indicated the infinite and absolute power and authority of Allah, the Exalted, in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2516. This narration advises that the entire creation cannot benefit a person if Allah, the Exalted, did not desire them to do so. Similarly, the entire creation together could not harm someone if Allah, the Exalted, did not desire them to. This means only what Allah, the Exalted, decides happens within the universe. It is important to note that this advice does not indicate one should abandon using means such as medicine, but it means that one can use the means as they have been created by none other than Allah, the Exalted. But they must understand that Allah, the Exalted, is the only one who decides the outcome of all things. For example, they are many sick people who take medicine and recover from their illness. But they are others who take medicine and do not recover. This indicates that another factor decides the end result namely, the will of Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 9 at Torba, verse 51. Say, never will we be struck except by what Allah has decreed for us. The one who understands this knows that anything that affected them could not have been avoided. And those things which missed them could never have been obtained. It is important to note that whatever the end result, even if it is against a person's desire, they should remain patient and truly believe Allah, the Exalted, has chosen the best for them, even if they do not observe the wisdom behind the outcome. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. When one truly understands this truth, they stop relying on the creation, knowing they cannot innately harm or benefit them. Instead, they turn to Allah, the Exalted, 
seeking his support and protection through sincere obedience by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. This leads a Muslim to trusting in Allah, the Exalted. It also encourages one to only fear Allah, the Exalted, as they know the creation cannot harm them without the will of Allah, the Exalted. Recognizing that all things which occur within one's life and the universe originate from Allah, the Exalted, is a part of understanding the oneness of Allah, the Exalted. This is a topic which has no end and goes beyond only superficially believing that there is none worthy of worship except Allah, the Exalted. When this is fixed in one's heart then they only hope in Allah, the Exalted, knowing He is the only one who can help them. They will only submit and obey Allah, the Exalted, in all aspects of their life. In reality, a person only obeys another in order to receive protection from harm or gain some benefit. Only Allah, the Exalted, can grant this therefore, only He deserves to be obeyed and worshipped. If anyone chooses the obedience of another over the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, this shows they believe that this other can bring them some sort of benefit or protect them from harm. This is a sign of the weakness of their faith. The source of all things which occur is Allah, the Exalted, so Muslims should only obey Him. Chapter 35 Fatih, verse 2 Whatever Allah grants to people of mercy, none can withhold it, and whatever He withholds none can release it thereafter. It is important to note, that obeying a person which encourages the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, in reality is obeying Allah, the Exalted. For example, obeying the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 80 He who obeys the Messenger has obeyed Allah. A beautiful sermon, number 4. Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, would give elegant, precise and useful sermons to the public, urging them towards success and peace in both worlds. The following sermon has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, pages 429 to 430. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, advised the people that this world is coming to an end and will soon bid farewell, and the hereafter is coming and will soon begin. A great obstacle to the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, is having false hope for a long life. It is an extremely blameworthy characteristic, as it is the main cause for a Muslim giving priority to amassing the material world over preparing for the hereafter. One only needs to assess their average 24-hour day and observe how much time they dedicate to the material world and how much time they dedicate to the hereafter in order to realize this truth. In fact, having false hope for a long life is one of the strongest weapons the devil uses in order to misguide people. When a person believes they will live long, they delay preparing for the hereafter, falsely believing they can prepare for it in the near future. In most cases, this near future never comes and a person passes away without adequately preparing for the hereafter. In addition, false hope for a long life causes one to delay sincere repentance and changing one's character for the better as they believe they have much time left to do this. It encourages a person to hoard the things of this material world, such as wealth, as it convinces them they will need these things during their long life on earth. The devil scares people into thinking they must hoard wealth for their old age, as they may find no one to support them when they become physically weaker and therefore can no longer work for themselves. They forget that the same way Allah, the Exalted, took care of their provision when they were younger, He will provide for them in old age too. In fact, the provision of the creation was allocated over 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6748. It is strange how a person will dedicate 40 years of their life saving for their retirement, which very rarely lasts longer than 20 years, but fails to prepare in the same way for the eternal hereafter. Islam does not teach Muslims to not prepare anything for the world. There is no harm in saving for the near future, as long as priority is given to the hereafter. Even though, people admit they may die at any time yet, some behave as if they will live forever in this world. Even to the point that if they were given a promise of eternal life on earth, they would not be able to strive harder in order to accumulate more of the material world, 
due to the restrictions of the day and night. How many people have passed away earlier than expected? And how many learn a lesson from this and change their behavior? In reality, one of the greatest pains a person will feel at the time of death or any other stage of the hereafter is regret for delaying their preparation for the hereafter. Chapter 63 al munafikan verses 10 to 11 And spend in the way of Allah from what we have provided you before death approaches one of you and he says, My Lord, if only you would delay me for a brief term so I would give charity and be of the righteous. But never will Allah delay a soul when its time has come. And Allah is aware of what you do. A person would be labeled a fool if they dedicated more time and wealth on a house which they were only going to live in for a short while, compared to a house they were planning to live in for a very long time. This is the example of giving priority to the temporal world over the eternal hereafter. Muslims should work for both the world and the hereafter. But know that death does not come to a person at a time, situation or age known to them, but it is certain to come. Therefore, preparing for it and what it leads to should take priority over preparing for a future in this world which is not certain to occur. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised the people that whoever falls short of obedience during the days of hope in this world before their death comes will be doomed. Even though there is no doubt that the mercy of Allah, the exalted, is infinite and can overcome all sins. And giving up hope in the infinite mercy of Allah, the exalted, is defined as unbelief in chapter 12 Yusuf, verse 87. Indeed, no one despairs of relief from Allah except the disbelieving people. Yet, nonetheless it is extremely important for Muslims to understand a fact. Namely, a Muslim has not been guaranteed to leave this world with their faith meaning, a Muslim is in danger of dying as a non-Muslim. This is the greatest loss. If this happens, it does not take a scholar to conclude where this person will reside in the hereafter. This can occur when a Muslim persists on sins especially, major sins, such as drinking alcohol and failing to offer their obligatory prayers and reaches their end without sincerely repenting from their sins. This is the reason why Muslims must sincerely repent from all their sins and strive to fulfill all their obligatory duties, as this is a task they can undoubtedly fulfill. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 286 Allah does not charge a soul except with that within its capacity. They should not be fooled into believing they possess hope in the mercy of Allah, the Exalted. As true hope in the mercy of Allah, the Exalted, is supported by obedience to Allah, the Exalted, through actions. This involves fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. Failing to do this and then expecting the mercy and forgiveness of Allah, the Exalted, is not hope in His mercy, it is merely wishful thinking which has no weight or significance. This has been clearly warned by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him, in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2459. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised the people to strive hard for the sake of Allah, the exalted, in the hope of reward, as they should strive hard for his sake from fear of his punishment. In a long divine narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7405, Allah, the exalted, advises that he ACTS and treats his servant according to their perception of him. This means if a Muslim has good thoughts and expects good from Allah, the Exalted, he in turn will not disappoint them. Similarly, if a person harbors negative thoughts about Allah, the Exalted, such as believing they will not be forgiven, then Allah, the Exalted, may act according to their belief. It is important to note, there is a vast difference between true hope in Allah, the Exalted, which this narration refers to, and wishful thinking. Wishful thinking is when one fails to strive in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience, and then expects Allah, the Exalted, to forgive them. This is not true hope, it is merely wishful thinking. This is like a farmer who fails to plant any seeds, fails to water their crop, and still hopes to reap a large harvest. True hope is when one strives to obey Allah, the Exalted, and whenever they slip up they sincerely repent and then hope for the mercy and forgiveness of Allah, the Exalted. This is like a farmer who plants seeds, waters their crop, 
dedicates effort to keeping the crop healthy and then hopes for a large harvest. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has summarized this explanation in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2459. Generally speaking, a Muslim should harbor more fear of Allah, the Exalted, during their life as it prevents sins which is superior to hope, which inspires one to perform righteous deeds especially, the voluntary type. But during periods of illness and difficulty, and especially at the time of death, a Muslim should have nothing but hope in the mercy of Allah, the Exalted, even if they have spent their life disobeying Him, as this has specifically been commanded by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 2877. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised the people that the one who does not benefit from the truth will be harmed by falsehood. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1971, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, discussed the importance of truthfulness and avoiding lies. The first part advises that truthfulness leads to righteousness, which in turn leads to paradise. When a person persists on truthfulness, they are recorded by Allah, the Exalted, as a truthful person. It is important to note that truthfulness has three levels. The first is when one is truthful in their intention and sincerity. Meaning, they act only for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, and do not benefit others for an ulterior motive such as fame. This in fact is the foundation of Islam, as every action is judged on one's intention. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1. The next level is when one is truthful through their words. This in reality means they avoid all types of verbal sins, not just lies. As the one who indulges in other verbal sins, cannot be a real truthful person. An excellent way of achieving this is by acting on a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, Number 2317, which advises that a person can only make their Islam excellent when they avoid getting involved in the things which do not concern them. The majority of verbal sins occur because a Muslim discusses something which does not concern them. The final stage is truthfulness in actions. This is achieved through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from his prohibitions, and being patient with destiny, according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, without cheery picking or misinterpreting the teachings of Islam which suit one's desires. They must adhere to hierarchy and priority order set by Allah, the Exalted, in all actions. The consequences of the opposite of these levels of truthfulness, namely, lying, according to the main narration under discussion, is that it leads to disobedience, which in turn leads to the fire of hell. When one persists on this attitude, they will be recorded as a great liar by Allah, the Exalted. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised the people that Allah, the Exalted, has promised paradise to those who obey him. It is important to note that one will only enter paradise through the mercy of Allah, the Exalted. This has been confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 5673. This is because every righteous deed is only possible through the mercy of Allah, the Exalted, in the form of knowledge, inspiration, strength and opportunity to do the deed. This understanding prevents one from adopting pride, which is vital to avoid as only an atom's worth of pride is needed to take a person to hell. This has been warned in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 267. In addition, a Muslim must understand that this mercy of Allah, the Exalted, in the form of righteous deeds, is in reality a light which one must gather in this world, if they desire to obtain a guiding light in the hereafter. If a Muslim lives in heedlessness and refrains from gathering this light in the world by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience, then how can they expect to receive this guiding light in the hereafter? All Muslims desire to inhabit paradise with the greatest servants of Allah, the Exalted, such as the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. But it is important to understand that simply wishing for this without action will not make it come true, otherwise the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, would have done this. Simply put, the more one strives in learning and acting on the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, the closer they will be to him in the hereafter. 
The greatest blessing of paradise is physically observing Allah, the Exalted, which is discussed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7436. If a Muslim desires to obtain this unimaginable blessing, they must practically strive to achieve the level of excellence mentioned in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 99. This is when one performs actions such as the prayer, as if they can observe Allah, the Exalted, overlooking them. This attitude ensures one's persistent and sincere obedience to Allah, the Exalted. It is hoped that the one who strives for this level of faith will receive the blessing of physically observing Allah, the Exalted, in the hereafter. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised the people that Allah, the Exalted, has warned those who disobey him of hell. The thing to remember is that in reality each person who will end up in hell takes the fire which they will encounter in hell with them from this world in the form of their sins. When a Muslim engraves this reality into their mind, they will observe each sin, major or minor, as a piece of unbearable fire. The same way a person avoids fire in this world, they should avoid sins as in reality sins are like hidden fire which will be shown to them in the hereafter. In addition, a Muslim should not live in heedlessness and believe they can simply claim love for Allah, the Exalted, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, without supporting this verbal declaration with actions. If this was true, then the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, would not have strived so hard in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, and they undoubtedly understood Islam and Judgment Day better than the people after them. Simply put, a declaration of love without actions will not save one from hell. In fact, it has been made clear that some Muslims will enter hell on Judgment Day. The Muslim who abandons acting on Islamic teachings should understand that their attitude may cause them to lose their faith before their death, so that they enter Judgment Day as a non-Muslim, which is the greatest loss. The same way one would not enter a battle without armor and a shield, a Muslim should not enter Judgment Day without the armor and shield of righteous deeds. Otherwise, the same way the soldier who has no protection will most likely be harmed, so will a Muslim who reaches Judgment Day without the protection provided by the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. A Muslim should remember that the luxuries and pleasures of the material world they enjoyed will not make them feel better if they end up in hell. In fact, it will only make them feel worse. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, advised the people that Allah, the Exalted, has warned of hell for those who disobey him. A Balanced Diet Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once advised that hard-heartedness comes from a full stomach. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, page 436. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2380, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised the importance of a balanced diet. He advised that one should split their stomach into three parts. The first part is for food, the second part is for drink, and the last part should be left empty for breathing. This can be achieved when one stops eating before they reach their fill. This was the behavior of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them. If people were to act on this advice, they would be safe from both physical and mental illnesses. In fact, according to many knowledgeable people, one of the main causes of illness is indigestion. In respect to the heart, little food leads to a soft heart, humility of self and weakness of desires and anger. A full stomach results in laziness which prevents worship and other righteous deeds. It induces sleep, which causes one to miss out on the voluntary and even the obligatory night prayers. It prevents reflection, which is the key to assessing one's deeds and therefore changing one's character for the better. The one with a full stomach forgets the poor and is therefore less likely to help them. All these negative effects lead to a hard heart. The one who possesses a hard heart will not be safe on the day of judgment. Chapter 26 Ash-Shu'ara, verses 88 to 89. The day when there will not benefit anyone well for children, but only one who comes to Allah with a sound heart. The one who is only concerned about their stomach becomes distracted from more important things, 
such as learning and acting on religious knowledge. Muslims should know that the most fed in this world will be the hungriest on the Day of Judgment. This is confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2478. Therefore, Muslims should strive to obtain a balanced diet, so that they avoid the negative effects discussed which will undoubtedly hinder their success in both this world and the next. True Nobility Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once advised that preeminence comes from virtue and good character, not from lineage. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, page 436. In a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 5116, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, clearly warned that nobility does not lie in one's lineage as all people are the descendants of the Holy Prophet Adam, peace be upon him, and he was made of dust. Therefore, people should give up boasting about their relatives and lineage. It is important to understand that even though some ignorant Muslims have adopted the attitude of other nations by creating castes and sects thereby believing some people are superior to others based on these groups, Islam declared a simple criterion for superiority, namely, piety. Meaning, the more a Muslim fulfills the commands of Allah, the exalted, refrains from his prohibitions and faces destiny with patience, the greater they are in rank in the sight of Allah, the exalted. Chapter 49 Al-Hajarat, verse 13 Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. This verse destroys all other standards which have been created by ignorant people such as one's race, ethnicity, wealth, gender or social status. In addition, if a Muslim is proud of a pious person in their lineage, they should correctly demonstrate this belief by praising Allah, the exalted, and following in their footsteps. Boasting about others without following in their footsteps will not help someone in either this world or the next. This has been made clear in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2945. Finally, the one who is proud of others but fails to follow in their footsteps is indirectly dishonoring them as the outside world will observe their bad character and assume their righteous ancestor behaved in the same manner. These people should therefore strive harder in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, because of this reason. These are like those people who adopt the outward traditions and advice of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, such as growing a beard or wearing a scarf yet, fail to adopt his inner character. The outside world will only think negatively about the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, when they observe the bad character of these Muslims. Benefit Yourself Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once advised that kindness is one of the best of treasures. One should not be discouraged from doing ACTS of kindness by the ingratitude of those who reject it. Kindness cannot be complete except with three things, thinking little of it, concealing it and hastening to do it. Thinking little of it makes it great. Concealing it makes it perfect. Hastening it will allow people to enjoy it. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, page 437. It is important for Muslims to understand that when they treat others kindly, it in reality benefits themselves and not others. This is because treating others kindly has been commanded by Allah, the Exalted, and fulfilling this important duty gains one reward. In addition, when one is kind to others, they will supplicate for them while they are alive, which will benefit them. For example, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6929, that a supplication done for a person in secret is always answered. In addition, the people will supplicate for them after they pass away, which is definitely answered, as it has been recorded in the Holy Quran. Chapter 59 Al-Hash verse 10 Saying, Our Lord forgive us and our brothers who preceded us in faith. Finally, a person who treated others kindly will gain their intercession on the day of judgment, which is a day people will be desperate for the intercession of others. This has been confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7439. But those who mistreat others even if they fulfill their duties towards Allah, the Exalted, will miss out on the benefits mentioned earlier. 
And on Judgment Day, they will find that Allah, the Exalted, will not forgive them until their victim forgives them first. If they choose not to, then the oppressor's good deeds will be given to their victim, and if needed, the victim's sins will be given to their oppressor. This may cause the oppressor to be hurled into hell. This has been warned in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6579. Therefore, a Muslim should be kind to themselves by being kind to others, as in reality they are only benefiting themselves in this world and the next. Chapter 29 al ankaba verse 6 And whoever strives only strives for the benefit of himself. Perfecting Islam Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once warned that the one who asks about things which do not concern them, will miss out on the things which do concern them. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, page 438. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2317, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that a Muslim cannot make their Islam excellent until they avoid the things which do not concern them. This narration contains an all-encompassing advice which should be applied to every aspect of one's life. It includes a person's speech as well as their other physical actions. It means that a Muslim who desires to perfect their faith must avoid those things through speech and actions which do not concern them. And instead they must occupy themselves with those things that do. One should take the things that concern them very seriously and strive to fulfill the responsibilities which accompany them according to the teachings of Islam solely for the pleasure of Allah, the Exalted. It is important to note that one would not be perfecting their faith if they avoided things according to their own thinking or desires. But the one who perfects their faith avoids the things which Islam has advised to avoid. Meaning, one should strive to fulfill all their duties, avoid all sins and the things which are disliked in Islam, and even avoid the excess use of unnecessary lawful things. Achieving this excellence is a characteristic of the excellence of faith, mentioned in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 99. This is when one ACTS and worships Allah, the Exalted, as if they can observe Him, or they at least become fully aware of Allah, the Exalted, observing their every thought and action. Being aware of this divine surveillance will encourage a Muslim to always abstain from sins and hasten towards righteous deeds. The one who does not avoid the things which do not concern them will not reach this level of excellence. A major aspect of avoiding the things which do not concern a person is linked to speech. The majority of sins occur when a person utters words which do not concern them, such as backbiting and slander. The definition of vain talk is when a person utters words which may not be sinful, but are useless and therefore not their concern. As confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2408, vain speech is hated by Allah, the Exalted. Countless arguments, fights and even physical harm have occurred simply because someone spoke about something which did not concern them. Many families have become divided. Many marriages have ended because someone did not mind their business. It is why Allah, the Exalted, has advised in the Holy Quran the different types of useful speech which people should concern themselves with. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 114. No good is there in much of their private conversation, except for those who enjoin charity or that which is right or conciliation between people. And whoever does that seeking means to the approval of Allah, then we are going to give him a great reward. In fact, uttering words which are not a person's concern will be the main reason people enter hell. This has been indicated in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2616. This is why the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2412, that all speech will be counted against a person unless it is connected to advising good, forbidding evil, or the remembrance of Allah, the Exalted. This means that all other forms of speech are not a person's concern, as they will not benefit them. It is important to note that advising good encompasses anything which is beneficial in one's worldly and religious life, such as their occupation. Therefore, Muslims should strive to avoid the things which do not concern them through words and actions, so that they can perfect their faith. Put simply, the one who dedicates time to the things which do not concern them will fail in the things which do concern them. 
and the one who occupies themselves with the things which do concern them, will not find time to spend on the things which do not concern them. Meaning they will achieve success through the mercy of Allah, the Exalted, in both worlds. Importance of Good Companionship Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once warned that accompanying a foolish person is a loss in this world and a regret in the hereafter. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, page 438. Muslims should note that a major sign of true love is when one directs their beloved towards the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This is because obedience leads to success and safety in both this world and in the hereafter. A person who does not desire safety and success for a person can never truly love them irrespective of what they claim or how they treat the other person. The same way a person becomes happy when their beloved obtains worldly success, like a job, they will also desire their beloved to obtain success in the hereafter. If a person does not care about another obtaining safety and success especially in the next world, then they do not love them. A true lover could not bear knowing and seeing their beloved facing difficulties and punishment in this world or in the next. This is only avoidable through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted. Therefore, they would always direct their beloved towards the obedience of Allah, the Exalted. If a person directs another towards their own selfish interest or the interest of others instead of the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, it is a clear sign that they do not truly love them. This applies to all relationships, such as friendships and relatives. Therefore, a Muslim should assess whether those in their life direct them towards Allah, the Exalted, or not. If they do, then it is a clear sign of their love for them. If they do not, then it is a clear sign that they do not truly love them. Chapter 43 as Zukruf, verse 67. Close friends that day will be enemies to each other, except for the righteous. Social freedom. Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once warned that a person should not become a slave to any of the creation when Allah, the Exalted, has created them free. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, page 439. First of all, it is important to understand that the major thing which separates a human from an animal is the fact that people live by a higher moral code. If people abandoned this and simply acted on their desires, then there would be no difference between them and animals. In fact, people would be worse as they possess the higher level of thinking yet, still choose to live like animals. Secondly, whether people want to admit it or not, in reality, every person is a servant of something or someone. Some are servants of others, such as Hollywood executives, and do whatever they command them to do, even if it challenges modesty and shame. Others are servants of their relatives and friends, and do whatever it takes to please them. Others are the worst by being servants of their own desires, as this is the attitude of animals who generally act to please themselves. The best and highest form of servanthood is being a servant of Allah, the Exalted. This is quite evident if one turns the pages of history, which clearly shows that those who were the servants of Allah, the Exalted, such as the Holy Prophets, peace be upon them, were granted the highest honor and respect in this world, and will be granted this in the next. Centuries and millennia have passed, yet their names are remembered as the pillars and beacons of history. Whereas those who became servants of others especially, their own desires were eventually disgraced in this world, even if they achieved some worldly status, and they became mere footnotes in history. The media barely remembers those who pass away for more than a few days before moving on to the next person to report on. During their lives these people eventually become sad, lonely, depressed and even suicidal as selling their souls and decency to their worldly masters did not grant them the contentment they were looking for. One does not need to be a scholar to understand this obvious truth. So if people must be servants, they should be the servants of Allah, the Exalted, as lasting honor, greatness and true success lies only in this. Those who disbelieve or avoid acting on their faith in Islam, do so out of love for the material world and the things within it. They believe that believing or acting on their faith 
will prevent them from enjoying worldly blessings meaning, for them, faith is something that restricts their desires, and therefore they turn away from it, either literally or practically. Instead they turn towards the material world, and strive to fulfill their desires without restrictions believing that true peace lies in this. They look down at those who accept and actualize their faith by controlling their actions, and using their worldly blessings in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. They believe that these pious Muslims are lowly slaves who've been restricted from enjoying themselves, whereas they, the disbelievers and the misguided, are free. But in actual fact, this could not be further from the truth, as the real slaves are those who fail to accept and submit to Allah, the exalted, and the superior ones, are those who have done this, as they become free of slavery to the world. This can be understood by an example. A good parent will restrict the type of food their child eats meaning, they will only let them eat junk and unhealthy food once in a while, and instead force them to follow a healthy diet. This child therefore believes that their parent has placed undesirable restrictions on them, and that they have become slaves to their parent and their healthy diet. On the other hand, another child has been given permission from their parent to eat whatever they desire, whenever they desire, and how much they desire. So this child believes that they are completely free of all restrictions. When these children come together, the child who has been given complete freedom criticizes and looks down on the child who has been restricted by their parent. The latter child will also feel sorry for themselves when they observe the other child has been given free reign to behave however they wish. Outwardly it appears the child who has been granted free has obtained happiness, whereas the other child is too tied up with restrictions to enjoy life. But years down the line the truth will become manifest. The child who had no restrictions, grows up to become extremely unhealthy e.g. obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, etc. As a result of this, they even become mentally unhealthy, as they lose confidence in their body and the way they look. Because of this they become a slave of medications, diseases, mental and social problems. All these things restrict their happiness and life. Whereas, the child who was restricted by their parent grows up healthy in mind and body. As a result they become confident in their body and ability, which aids them to succeed in life. They become free of any slavery to medications, diseases, mental and social problems as they grew up with the correct balance and guidance. So the child who had no restrictions, grew up becoming a slave to many things, whereas the child who had restrictions, grew up independent of all restrictions. To conclude, the real slave is the one who becomes a slave to all other things except Allah, the exalted, such as social media, society, fashion and culture. And this leads to mental, physical and social problems, whereas the real free person is the one who submits only to Allah, the exalted, thereby achieving peace of mind and body. The best of people. Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once described the best of people. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, pages 440 to 441. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, described the best of people as those who become hopeful when they do righteous deeds. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2459, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, described the difference between true hope in the mercy of Allah, the exalted, and wishful thinking. True hope is when one controls their soul by avoiding the disobedience of Allah, the exalted, and actively struggles for preparing for the hereafter. Whereas, the foolish wishful thinker follows their desires and then expects Allah, the exalted, to forgive them and fulfill their wishes. It is important for Muslims not to confuse these two attitudes so that they avoid living and dying as a wishful thinker, as this person is highly unlikely to succeed in this world or the next. Wishful thinking is like a farmer who fails to prepare the land for planting, fails to plant seeds, fails to water the land, and then expects to harvest a huge crop. This is plain foolishness, and this farmer is highly unlikely to succeed. Whereas, true hope is like a farmer who prepares the land, plants seeds, waters the land, and then hopes Allah, the exalted, will bless them with a huge harvest. The key difference is that the one who possesses true hope will actively strive to obey Allah, the exalted, by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And whenever they slip up, they sincerely repent.
Whereas, the wishful thinker will not actively strive in obeying Allah, the Exalted, and instead follow their desires and still expect Allah, the Exalted, to forgive them and fulfill their wishes. Muslims must therefore learn the key difference so that they can abandon wishful thinking and instead adopt true hope in Allah, the Exalted, which always leads to nothing except good and success in both worlds. This has been indicated in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7405. A specific type of wishful thinking which affected the past nations and even the Muslim nation is when a person believes that they can ignore the commands and prohibitions of Allah, the Exalted, and somehow someone on the Day of Judgment will intercede for them and save them from hell. Even though the intercession of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is a fact and has been discussed in many narrations, such as the one found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 4308. Nonetheless, even with his intercession, some Muslims whose punishment will be reduced by it will still enter hell. Even a single moment in hell is truly unbearable. So one should abandon wishful thinking and instead adopt true hope by practically striving in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted. The devil convinces those who do not believe in Judgment Day that even if it occurs they will make peace with Allah, the Exalted, on that day by claiming that they were not so bad as they avoided major crimes such as murder. They have convinced themselves that their pleas will be accepted and they will be sent to paradise even though they disbelieved in Allah, the Exalted, during their lives on earth. This is incredibly foolish, as Allah, the Exalted, will not treat the person who believed in Him and tried to obey Him like the one who disbelieved in Him. A single verse has erased this type of wishful thinking. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 85 And whoever desires other than Islam as religion, never will it be accepted from him, and he in the hereafter will be among the losers. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him. Describe the best of people as those who sincerely repent when they commit sins. In a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 4251, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that people commit sins but the best person who commits sins is the one who sincerely repents. As people are not angels, they are bound to commit sins. The thing that makes these people special is when they sincerely repent from their sins. Sincere repentance includes feeling remorse, seeking the forgiveness of Allah, the Exalted, and anyone who has been wronged, making a firm promise not to commit the sin or a similar sin again, and making up for any rights which have been violated in respect to Allah, the Exalted, and people. It is important to note, minor sins can be erased through righteous deeds which has been advised in many narrations, such as the one found in Sahih Muslim, number 550. It advises that the five daily obligatory prayers and two consecutive Friday congregational prayers erase the minor sins committed in between them as long as major sins are avoided. Major sins are only erased through sincere repentance. Therefore, a Muslim should strive to avoid all sins, minor and major, and if they happen to occur to immediately sincerely repent, as the time of death is unknown. And they should continue obeying Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, describe the best of people as those who remain patient when they face trials. It is important for Muslims to understand a simple thing which can aid them with patiently facing destiny and the difficulties it brings. A person happily takes a bitter medicine which their doctor prescribes fully trusting in their knowledge, experience and choice all the while believing that their doctor knows what is best for them. This is true even though they are only human and prone to errors. Yet, many Muslims fail to place this same level of trust in Allah, the Exalted, even though his knowledge is infinite and his choice is always the wisest. Muslims should try to accept destiny and the troubles it brings, just like they take the bitter medicine without complaining knowing it is best for them. They should understand that the troubles and difficulties they face are best for them, even if they do not understand or observe the wisdoms in them, just like they do not understand the science behind the bitter medicine they happily take. Even though in most cases they will never understand the science behind the bitter medicine they take, a time will certainly come, whether in this world or in the hereafter, when the wisdom behind the bitter difficulties they faced will be revealed to them. So a Muslim should anticipate this time patiently, knowing all will be revealed shortly. 
Pondering deeply over this can increase one's patience when dealing with difficulties. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216. But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, describe the best of people as those who forgive others when they are angry. All Muslims hope that on Judgment Day Allah, the Exalted, will put aside, overlook and forgive their past mistakes and sins. But the strange thing is that most of these same Muslims who hope and pray for this, do not treat others in the same way. Meaning, they often latch on to the past mistakes of others and use them as weapons against them. This is not referring to those mistakes which have an effect on the present or future. For example, a car accident caused by a driver which physically disables another person is a mistake which will affect the victim in the present and future. This type of mistake is understandably difficult to let go and overlook. But many Muslims often latch on to the mistakes of others which do not influence the future in any way, such as a verbal insult. Even though the mistake has faded away, yet these people insist on reviving and using it against others when the opportunity presents itself. It is a very sad mentality to possess, as one should understand that people are not angels. At the very least a Muslim who hopes for Allah, the Exalted, to overlook their past mistakes should overlook the past mistakes of others. Those who refuse to behave in this manner will find that the majority of their relationships are fractured as no relationship is perfect. They will always be a disagreement which can lead to a mistake in every relationship. Therefore, the one who behaves in this manner will end up lonely as their bad mentality causes them to destroy their relationships with others. It is strange that these very people hate to be lonely yet adopt an attitude which drives others away from them. This defies logic and common sense. All people want to be loved and respected while they are alive and after they pass away, but this attitude causes the very opposite to occur. While they are alive, people become fed up with them and when they die, people do not remember them with true affection and love. If they do remember them, it is merely out of custom. Letting the past go does not mean one needs to be overly nice to others, but the least one can do is be respectful according to the teachings of Islam. This does not cost anything and requires little effort. One should therefore learn to overlook and let the past mistakes of people go. Perhaps then Allah, the Exalted, will overlook their past mistakes on the Day of Judgment. Chapter 24 and Nur, verse 22. And let them pardon and overlook. Would you not like that Allah should forgive you? And Allah is forgiving and merciful. Qualities of a believer. Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once described some qualities of a believer. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, volume 1, page 441. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, advised that when a believer looks at something, they learn a lesson from it. It is important for a Muslim to understand a key truth, namely, nothing in creation occurs without a wise reason, even if people do not observe this wisdom immediately. A Muslim should treat everything which occurs, whether they are in times of ease or difficulty, as a message in a bottle. They should not get too caught up in assessing and examining the bottle, as it is merely a messenger which delivers the important message. This occurs when Muslims either exult over the good things which occur thereby becoming heedless to the message within the good thing. Or they become grieved during difficulties, thereby becoming too distracted to understand the message within the difficulty. They should instead concentrate on following the advice of the Holy Quran and approach each situation in a balanced way. Chapter 57 Al-Hadid, verse 23 in order that you not despair over what has eluded you, and not exult in pride over what he has given you. This verse does not prohibit being happy or sad in different situations, as this is a part of human nature. But it advises a balanced approach whereby one avoids extreme emotions namely, exultant which is excessive happiness or grief which is excessive sadness. This balanced approach will allow one to focus their mind on the more important message inside the bottle meaning inside the situation, whether it is a situation of ease or difficulty. 
Through assessing, understanding and acting on the hidden message, a Muslim can improve their worldly and religious life for the better. Sometimes the message will be a wake-up call to turn back to Allah, the exalted, before their time runs out. Sometimes it will be a way of raising their rank. Other times a way of erasing their sins, and sometimes a reminder not to attach themselves to the temporal material world and the things in it. Without this assessment, one will merely journey through events without improving their worldly or religious life. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, advised that when a believer is silent, it should be because they are thinking about something important. Merely performing worship will not raise someone to the highest levels of faith. Muslims can only reach this level by purifying their inner beings. This is achieved by removing the negative characteristics they possess and replacing them with good characteristics. But this is only achieved through serious reflection and self-assessment. When one recognizes their own reality, this will encourage them to live like a servant and fulfill the purpose of their creation. This will lead them to recognizing Allah, the Exalted, as their Lord, which is the ultimate goal. Chapter 51 Ad Dariat, verse 56 And I did not create the jinn and mankind except to worship me. This self-assessment is vital for triggering one to take the steps needed to purify their character and soul of evil characteristics, which is the path of success in both worlds. Some are so lost in the material world, they never perform this important deed, and therefore decades pass by without them changing one single bit. Muslims must use the time of strength they have been given, in order to self-assess and change for the better before they reach the final stage of weakness. At this point they will desire to change, but they will not possess the intelligence or strength to do so. This has been indicated in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6412. One only needs to turn the pages of history to observe those who were given great power and wealth. But eventually a time came when their moment of strength ran out, and because of their persistent disobedience they were destroyed. Those who use their moments of strength in the correct way by pleasing Allah, the Exalted, will be blessed by Him in such a way that even after departing from this world, they will still be honored by society. As the majority of Muslims do not understand the Arabic language, an abundant amount of worship will not trigger this inner purification. One can only reach it by reflecting on this material world, death, the grave and hell. Because of this, a single moment of reflection can become better than 60 years of voluntary worship. Those who live without wisdom or reflection habitually make mistakes which only lead to constant stress. It is these people who lead an aimless life with no higher aspirations and move through each day without understanding their true purpose. The pious always take time out of their day to reflect on their aims, what actions they have performed and whether they have pleased Allah, the exalted or not. This mentality will ensure that one avoids sins, performs righteous deeds and if they happen to commit sins to sincerely repent. This mentality fits the advice given by the second rightly guided Caliph of Islam, Omar bin Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, which is recorded in Imam Asfahani's Hilyat al Uliya, number 98. He advised that one should judge their own actions before someone else judges them namely, Allah, the Exalted, on the Day of Judgment. This self-assessment is the key which inspires one to sincerely repent and change for the better. This is the best stage compared to the stage where one only realizes their mistakes when another points it out to them. But even this stage requires one to possess good friends and relatives who are wise and sincerely concerned over their eternal welfare instead of only being concerned with the material world. A truly blessed Muslim is the one who possesses these types of relatives and friends who aid them to adopt piety. Reflecting at the start of one's day also ensures a person prioritizes their daily tasks and saves time by avoiding those tasks which should be delayed. The following verse describes the state of successful Muslims. They reflect on and are deeply affected by the teachings of Islam and strive to implement them in their lives. If one is affected in this way they should be grateful to Allah, the Exalted, and show no signs of pride. But if one is not affected in this way, they must repent and change before it is too late. Chapter 5 al maida verse 83 And when they hear what has been revealed to the Messenger, you see their eyes overflowing with tears because of what they have recognized of the truth. 
A lack of self-reflection has caused Muslims to become lost in the material world, even though Islamic knowledge is more readily available than it ever was. Voluntary worship will only take one so far, but to reach the height of faith they must reflect and assess their character. This will inspire them to abandon their evil traits and replace them with good ones. The vital ingredient needed to stimulate this self-assessment and reflection is Islamic knowledge which must be obtained from a reliable source. This is one of the reasons the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, declared in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 224, that obtaining this type of knowledge is obligatory on all Muslims. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, advised that when a believer speaks, they speak words of wisdom. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2501, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, declared that whoever is silent is saved. This means the one who is silent from vain or evil speech and only speaks good words will be saved by Allah, the Exalted, in both worlds. This is important to understand, as the main reason people will enter hell is because of their speech. This has been warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2616. In fact, it only takes a single evil word to cause a person to plunge into hell on Judgment Day, which has been confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2314. Speech can be of three types. The first is evil speech, which should be avoided at all costs. The second is vain speech which only causes one to waste time, which will lead to a great regret on Judgment Day. In addition, the first step of sinful speech is often vain speech. So it is safer to avoid this type of speech. The final type is good speech, which should always be adopted. Based on these aspects, two-thirds of speech should be removed from one's life. In addition, the one who speaks too much will only reflect on their actions and the hereafter a little, as this requires silence. This will prevent one from assessing their deeds, which inspires one to perform more righteous deeds and sincerely repent from their sins. This person will then be prevented from changing for the better. Finally, those who speak too much often discuss worldly things and things which are entertaining and fun. This will cause them to adopt a mentality, whereby they dislike discussing or listening to serious issues like death and the hereafter. This will prevent them from preparing adequately for the hereafter, which will lead to a great regret and a potential punishment. All of this can be avoided if one simply remains silent from sinful and vain speech and instead only speaks good words. Therefore, the one who is silent in this way will be saved from trouble in this world and from punishment in the next world. Anonymous Servants Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once gave glad tidings to the unknown sincere servants of Allah, the Exalted, of being saved by Allah, the Exalted, from every dark trial and gaining his mercy. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, page 441. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 7432, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Allah, the Exalted, loves the servant who is anonymous. This means a Muslim should not strive in worldly or religious matters in order to obtain fame. As this can lead to many sins, such as showing off, and this only destroys one's reward. It is why a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2376, warns that seeking fame is more destructive to one's religion than two wolves which are let loose on a herd of sheep. Instead, a Muslim should strive to fulfill their duties and if they become famous, they must maintain sincerity to Allah, the Exalted, without altering their obedience to Him in order to please people, as this leads to destruction in both worlds. A Beautiful Sermon Number 5 Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, would give elegant, precise and useful sermons to the public, urging them towards success and peace in both worlds. The following sermon has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, page 443. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, advise the people that the best means by which a person can draw close to Allah, the Exalted, is faith. True belief involves sincerity. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim number 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards Allah, the Exalted. 
Sincerity towards Allah, the Exalted, includes fulfilling all the duties given by Him in the form of commands and prohibitions solely for His pleasure. As confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number one, all will be judged by their intention. So if one is not sincere towards Allah, the Exalted, when performing good deeds they will gain no reward in this world or in the next. In fact, according to a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3154, those who performed insincere deeds will be told on Judgment Day to seek their reward from those who they acted for, which will not be possible. Chapter 98 al bayna verse 5 And they were not commanded except to worship Allah, being sincere to him in religion. If one is lax in fulfilling their duties towards Allah, the Exalted, it proves a lack of sincerity. Therefore, they should sincerely repent and struggle to fulfill them all. It is important to bear in mind Allah, the Exalted, never burdens one with duties they cannot perform or handle. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 286 Allah does not charge a soul, except with that within its capacity. Being sincere towards Allah, the Exalted, means that one should always choose his pleasure over the pleasure of themselves and others. A Muslim should always give priority to those actions which are for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, over all else. One should love others and dislike their sins for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, and not for the sake of their own desires. When they help others or refuse to take part in sins, it should be for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. The one who adopts this mentality has perfected their faith. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4681. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised the people to establish the obligatory prayers, as they are the foundation of religion. In a narration found in Jami at Termidi, number 2618, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that the difference between belief and disbelief is abandoning the obligatory prayers. In this day and age, this has become far too common. Many give up their obligatory prayers for trivial reasons, all of which are undoubtedly rejected. If the obligation of the prayer has not been removed for the one who is engaging in battle, how can it be removed from anyone else? Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 102. And when you, i.e. the commander of an army are among them and lead them in prayer, let a group of them stand in prayer with you and let them carry their arms. And when they have prostrated, let them be in position behind you and have the other group come forward which has not yet prayed and let them pray with you, taking precaution and carrying their arms. Neither is the traveler or the sick exempt from offering their obligatory prayers. The traveler has been advised to reduce the amount of cycles in some of the obligatory prayers in order to reduce the burden for them but they have not been exempt from offering them. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 101. And when you travel throughout the land, there is no blame upon you for shortening the prayer. The sick have been advised to perform dry ablution if contact with water will harm them. Chapter 5 al Maida, verse 6. But if you are ill or on a journey or one of you comes from the place of relieving himself or you have contacted women and do not find water, then seek clean earth and wipe over your faces and hands with it. In addition, the sick can perform the obligatory prayer in a way which is easier for them. Meaning, if they cannot stand, they are allowed to sit, and if they cannot sit, they can lay down and offer the obligatory prayer. This is confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 372. But again, no complete exemption is granted to the sick unless one is mentally ill, which prevents them from comprehending the obligation of the prayer. The other major issue is that some Muslims delay their obligatory prayers and offer them beyond their correct times. This clearly contradicts the Holy Quran, as the believers have been described as those who offer their obligatory prayers on time. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 103. Indeed, Prayer has been decreed upon the believers a decree of specified times. Many believe that the following verse of the Holy Quran refers to those who unnecessarily delay their obligatory prayers. This has been discussed in Tafsir ibn Katir, volume 10, pages 603 to 604. Chapter 107 al mayn verses 4 to 5. 
So woe to those who pray, but who are heedless of their prayer. Here Allah, the Exalted, has clearly cursed those who have adopted this evil trait. How can one find success in this world or the next, if they have been removed from the mercy of Allah, the Exalted? The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, declared in a narration found in Sunan an nasai number 512, that delaying one's obligatory prayers unnecessarily is a sign of hypocrisy. The Holy Quran has made it clear that one of the main reasons people will enter hell is failing to establish the obligatory prayers. Chapter 74 al muddathir verses 42 to 43. And asking them, what put you into Sakal? They will say, we were not of those who prayed. Abandoning the obligatory prayers is such a serious sin that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, declared in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2621, that whoever commits this sin has disbelieved in Islam. In addition, no other good deed will benefit a Muslim until their obligatory prayers are not established. A narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 553, clearly warns that one's good deeds are destroyed if they miss the afternoon obligatory prayer. If this is the case for abandoning one obligatory prayer, can one imagine the penalty of abandoning them all? Observing the obligatory prayers at their correct times has been advised to be one of the most beloved deeds to Allah, the Exalted, in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 252. From this one can determine that delaying the obligatory prayers beyond their time or completely missing them is one of the most hated deeds by Allah, the Exalted. It is an important duty for all elders to encourage the children under their care to offer the obligatory prayers from a young age so that they establish them before it becomes legally binding on them. Those adults that delay this and wait until children are older have failed in this extremely important duty. The children who were only encouraged to offer the obligatory prayers when it became obligatory on them, very rarely established them quickly. In most cases, it takes years for them to fulfill this important duty correctly. And the blame falls on the elders of the family especially, the parents. This is why the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has advised in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 495, that families most encourage their children to offer the obligatory prayers when they turn seven years old. Another major issue many Muslims face is that they may offer the obligatory prayers but fail to do so correctly. For example, many do not complete the stages of the prayer correctly and instead rush through it. In fact, a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 757, clearly warns that the one who prays like this has not prayed at all. Meaning, they are not recorded as a person who offered their prayer, and therefore their obligation has not been fulfilled. A narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 265, clearly warns that the prayer of the one who does not settle in each position of the prayer is not accepted. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, described the one who does not bow or prostrate correctly in the prayer as the worst thief. This has been warned in a narration found in Mawata Malik, book number 9, narration number 75. Unfortunately, many Muslims who have spent decades offering their obligatory and many voluntary prayers like this will find that none of them have counted, and thus they will be treated as one who did not fulfill their obligation. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 1313. The Holy Quran indicates the importance of offering the obligatory prayers with congregation usually at a mosque. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah verse 43 And bow with those who bow in worship and obedience. In fact, due to this verse and narrations of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, some reliable scholars have declared this obligatory on Muslim men. For example, one narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood number 550 clearly warns that the Muslims who would not offer their obligatory prayers with congregation at the mosque were considered hypocrites by the companions, may Allah be pleased with them. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, even threatened to burn the houses of the men who failed to perform their obligatory prayers at the mosque with congregation without a valid excuse. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 1482. 
Those Muslims who are in a position to perform this important deed should do so. They should not fool themselves into claiming they are performing other righteous deeds, such as helping their family with house chores. Even though this is a tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, according to a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 676, but it is important not to rearrange the importance of his traditions according to one's desires. Whoever does this is not following his traditions, they are only following their own desires, even if they are performing a righteous deed. In fact, this same narration concludes by advising that when it was time for the obligatory prayer, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, would leave for the mosque. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised the people to donate the obligatory charity. Severe warnings over failing to donate the obligatory charity have been given in the Holy Quran and the narrations of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. For example, a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1403, warns that the person who does not donate their obligatory charity will encounter a large poisonous snake, which will continuously bite them on the day of judgment. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 180. And let not those who greedily withhold what Allah has given them of his bounty, ever think that it is better for them. Rather, it is worse for them. Their necks will be encircled by what they withheld on the day of resurrection. According to a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 4019, when the members of a society withhold the obligatory charity Allah, the exalted will withhold rain, and if it was not for the animals he would not let it rain at all. This major sin is therefore one potential cause of the long periods of drought some nations face. Not offering the obligatory charity is a sign of extreme greed, as it is only an extremely tiny portion of one's wealth, namely 2.5%. It is clear that the miser is far from Allah, the exalted, the people, and close to hell. This is confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1961. Muslims must understand that donating the obligatory charity does not only protect them from punishment, but it leads to blessings in one's life which far outweigh the wealth they donated. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has made it clear in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6592, that charity does not decrease one's wealth. This means that when one donates Allah, the exalted, compensates them. For example, he provides them with business opportunities which cause them to gain more wealth than they donated. This repayment is confirmed in many places of the Holy Quran, for example, chapter 57 Al-Hadid, verse 11. Who is it that would loan Allah a goodly loan, so he will multiply it for him and he will have a noble reward? In addition, this narration could indicate that as each person's provision is pre-recorded whatever wealth which is destined to be spent on them will never change irrespective of how much wealth a person donates. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6748. A Muslim must therefore avoid the wrath of Allah, the exalted, by donating a very small fraction of their wealth in the form of the obligatory charity, while hoping for a reward which is much greater both in this world and the next. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised the people to fast the month of Ramadan, as it is a protection against the punishment of Allah, the exalted. In a divine narration found in Sunan an nasr number 2219, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that all righteous deeds people perform are for themselves except for fasting, as this is for Allah, the Exalted, and he shall reward it directly. This narration indicates the uniqueness of fasting. One of the reasons it is described in this manner is because all other righteous deeds are visible to people, such as the prayer, or they are between people, such as secret charity. Whereas, fasting is a unique righteous deed, as others cannot know someone is fasting by only observing them. In addition, fasting is a righteous deed which puts a lock on every aspect of oneself. Meaning, a person who fasts correctly will be prevented from committing verbal and physical sins, such as looking at and hearing unlawful things. This is also achieved through the prayer, but the prayer is only performed for a short time and is visible to others whereas fasting occurs throughout the day and is invisible to others. 
Chapter 29 al Ankaba, verse 45. Indeed, prayer prohibits immorality and wrongdoing. It is clear from the following verse a person who does not complete the obligatory fasts without a valid reason will not be a true believer, as the two have been directly connected. Chapter 2 al Baqarah, verse 183. O you who have believed, Decreed upon you is fasting as it was decreed upon those before you that you may become righteous. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 723, that if a Muslim does not complete a single obligatory fast without a valid reason, they cannot make up for the reward and blessings lost even if they fasted every day for their entire life. In addition, as indicated by the verse quoted earlier, fasting correctly leads to piety. Meaning, simply starving during the day does not lead to piety, but paying extra attention to abstaining from sins and performing righteous deeds during the fast will lead to piety. It is why a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 707, warns that a fast will not be significant if one does not abstain from speaking and acting on falsehood. A similar narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 1690, warns that some fasting people obtain nothing except hunger. When one becomes more aware and careful in obeying Allah, the exalted, while they are fasting this habit, will eventually affect them, so they behave in a similar way, even when they are not fasting. This is in fact, true piety. The righteousness mentioned in the verse quoted earlier is connected to fasting, as fasting reduces one's evil desires and passions. It prevents pride and the encouragement of sins. This is because fasting hinders the appetite of the stomach and one's carnal desires. These two things lead to many sins. In addition, the desire for these two things is greater than the desire for other unlawful things. So whoever controls them through fasting will find it easier to control the weaker evil desires. This leads to true righteousness. As briefly indicated earlier, there are different levels of fasting. The first and lowest level of fasting is when one abstains from the things which will break their fast, such as food. The next level is abstaining from sins which damages one's fast, thereby reducing the reward of their fast, such as lying. This has been indicated in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 2235. Fasting which involves each member of the body is the next level. This is when each body part fasts from sins for example, the eyes from looking at the unlawful, the ears from listening to the unlawful, and so on. The next level is when one behaves in this manner, even when they are not fasting. Finally, the highest level of fasting is abstaining from all things which are not connected to Allah, the Exalted. A Muslim should also fast inwardly as their body fasts outwardly by abstaining from sinful or vain thoughts. They should fast from persisting on their own plans in respect to their desires and try to concentrate on fulfilling their duties and responsibilities. In addition, they should fast from inwardly challenging the decree of Allah, the Exalted, and instead accept destiny and whatever it brings, knowing Allah, the Exalted, only chooses the best for His servants, even if they do not understand the wisdom behind these choices. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. Finally, a Muslim should aim for the highest reward by keeping their fast a secret and not informing others if it is avoidable, as informing others unnecessarily leads to a loss of reward, as it is an aspect of showing off. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised the people to uphold their ties of kinship, as it increases love of family and blesses one's life. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2612, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the one who possesses complete faith is the one who is best in conduct and most kind to their family. Unfortunately, some have adopted the bad habit of treating non-relatives in a kind manner while mistreating their own family. They behave in this manner, as they do not understand the importance of treating one's own family kindly and as they fail to appreciate their family. A Muslim will never achieve success until they fulfill both aspects of faith. The first is fulfilling their duties towards Allah, the Exalted, 
by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. The second is to fulfill the rights of people, which includes treating them kindly. None have more right to this kind treatment than one's own family. A Muslim must aid their family in all matters which are good, and warn them against bad things and practices in a gentle way, according to the teachings of Islam. They should not blindly support them in bad things simply because they are their relatives, neither should they fail to help them in good matters, because of some ill feelings towards them, as this contradicts Islamic teachings. Chapter 5 al maida verse 2 And cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and aggression. The best way to guide others is through a practical example, as this is the tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him, and is much more effective than just verbal guidance. Finally, one should generally choose gentleness in all matters especially when dealing with their family. Even if they commit sins they should be warned in a gentle manner and still be aided in matters which are good, as this kindness is more effective in bringing them back to the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, than treating them harshly. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised the people to donate secret charity, as it expiates sins and extinguishes the wrath of the Lord. In a long narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6806, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, mentioned seven groups of people who will be granted shade on the Day of Judgment by Allah, the Exalted. This shade will protect them from the horrors of the Day of Judgment, which includes the unbearable heat caused by the sun being brought within two miles of the creation. This has been warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2421. One of these groups includes a person who donates secret charity. Even though donating charity publicly can invite and encourage others to do the same, which increases one's reward depending on how many people follow their behavior, which is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 2351. Yet, donating charity in secret avoids the dangerous sin of showing off, which destroys one's deed. When a Muslim donates in secret, it indicates their sincerity to only please Allah, the Exalted. It is important to note, this narration did not set a limit of how much charity must be donated. So a Muslim has no excuse if they fail to act on this advice as Allah, the Exalted, observes the quality of a deed meaning, a person's sincerity, not quantity. This has been confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1. In addition, charity in Islam is not only restricted to donating wealth. In fact, it encompasses all good deeds, such as commanding good and forbidding evil. This has been advised in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 1671. As long as one of these righteous deeds is done in secret without the person mentioning it to others, it is hoped they will fulfill this narration and be granted shade on Judgment Day. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised the people to remember Allah, the Exalted, much, as it is the best of remembrance. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6407, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the difference between the person who remembers Allah, the Exalted, and the one who does not, is like a living person compared to a dead person. It is important for Muslims who desire to create a strong connection with Allah, the Exalted, so that they can overcome all difficulties in this world and in the hereafter successfully, to remember Allah, the Exalted, as much as possible. Put simply, the more they remember Him, the more they will achieve this vital goal. This is achieved by practically acting on the three levels of the remembrance of Allah, the Exalted. The first level is to remember Allah, the Exalted, internally and silently. This includes correcting one's intention so that they only act in order to please Allah, the Exalted. The second is by remembering Allah, the Exalted, through one's tongue. But the highest and most effective way of strengthening one's bond with Allah, the Exalted, is practically remembering Him with one's limbs. This is achieved by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This requires one to gain and act on Islamic knowledge, which in turn is the root of all good and success in both worlds. 
Those who remain on the first two levels will receive reward depending on their intention, but they are unlikely to increase the strength of their faith and piety unless they move to the third and highest level of the remembrance of Allah, the Exalted. These stages are the key to peace and success in both worlds. Chapter 13 Arad, verse 28 Unquestionably, by the remembrance of Allah do hearts find peace. A beautiful sermon, number 6. Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, would give elegant, precise and useful sermons to the public, urging them towards success and peace in both worlds. The following sermon has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, page 446. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, told the people that he feared they would follow whims and desires and that will encourage them to abandon the truth. Islam teaches Muslims that they should never compromise on their faith in order to gain something from the material world. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 135. O you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves or parents and relatives. As the material world is temporary, whatever one gains from it will eventually fade away, and they will be held accountable for their actions and attitude in the hereafter. On the other hand, faith is the precious jewel which guides a Muslim through all difficulties in this world and in the hereafter safely. Therefore, it is plain foolishness to compromise the thing which is more beneficial and lasting for the sake of a temporary thing. Many people, especially women, will encounter moments in their lives where they will have to choose whether to compromise on their faith. For example, in some cases a Muslim woman may believe that if she removed her scarf and dressed a certain way, she would be more respected at work and may even climb the corporate ladder more quickly. Similarly, in the corporate world, it is considered important to mingle with colleagues after work hours. So a Muslim might find themselves being invited to a pub or club after work. In times like this, it is important to remember that ultimate victory and success will only be granted to those who remain steadfast on the teachings of Islam. Those who act in this way will be granted worldly and religious success. But more importantly, their worldly success will not become a burden for them. In fact, it will become a means for Allah, the Exalted, to increase their rank and remembrance amongst mankind. Examples of this are the rightly guided caliphs of Islam. They did not compromise on their faith and instead remained steadfast throughout their lives and in return Allah, the Exalted, granted them a worldly and religious empire. All other forms of success are very temporal and sooner or later they become a difficulty for its bearer. One only needs to observe the many celebrities who compromised on their ideals and belief in order to obtain fame and fortune, only for these things to become a cause of their sadness, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and even suicide. Reflect on these two paths for a moment and then decide which one should be preferred and chosen. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, told the people he feared that they would adopt hopes for a long life and that would encourage them to forget the hereafter. A great obstacle to the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, is having false hope for a long life. It is an extremely blameworthy characteristic, as it is the main cause for a Muslim giving priority to amassing the material world over preparing for the hereafter. One only needs to assess their average 24-hour day and observe how much time they dedicate to the material world and how much time they dedicate to the hereafter in order to realize this truth. In fact, having false hope for a long life is one of the strongest weapons the devil uses in order to misguide people. When a person believes they will live long, they delay preparing for the hereafter, falsely believing they can prepare for it in the near future. In most cases, this near future never comes and a person passes away without adequately preparing for the hereafter. In addition, False hope for a long life causes one to delay sincere repentance and changing one's character for the better as they believe they have much time left to do this. It encourages a person to hoard the things of this material world, such as wealth, as it convinces them they will need these things during their long life on earth. The devil scares people into thinking they must hoard wealth for their old age, as they may find no one to support them when they become physically weaker and therefore can no longer work for themselves. 
They forget that the same way Allah, the Exalted, took care of their provision when they were younger, He will provide for them in old age too. In fact, the provision of the creation was allocated over 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6748. It is strange how a person will dedicate 40 years of their life saving for their retirement, which very rarely lasts longer than 20 years, but fails to prepare in the same way for the eternal hereafter. Islam does not teach Muslims to not prepare anything for the world. There is no harm in saving for the near future, as long as priority is given to the hereafter. Even though, people admit they may die at any time yet, some behave as if they will live forever in this world. Even to the point that if they were given a promise of eternal life on earth, they would not be able to strive harder in order to accumulate more of the material world due to the restrictions of the day and night. How many people have passed away earlier than expected? And how many learn a lesson from this and change their behavior? In reality, one of the greatest pains a person will feel at the time of death or any other stage of the hereafter is regret for delaying their preparation for the hereafter. Chapter 63 al munafikan verses 10 to 11 And spend in the way of Allah from what we have provided you before death approaches one of you and he says, My Lord, if only you would delay me for a brief term so I would give charity and be of the righteous. But never will Allah delay a soul when its time has come. And Allah is aware of what you do. A person would be labeled a fool if they dedicated more time and wealth on a house which they were only going to live in for a short while, compared to a house they were planning to live in for a very long time. This is the example of giving priority to the temporal world over the eternal hereafter. Muslims should work for both the world and the hereafter, but know that death does not come to a person at a time, situation or age known to them, but it is certain to come. Therefore, preparing for it and what it leads to should take priority over preparing for a future in this world which is not certain to occur. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, told the people he feared that they would adopt hopes for a long life and that would encourage them to forget the hereafter. He added that the world is coming to an end soon and the hereafter is starting soon. Each one of them has children, therefore they should be from among the children of the hereafter and not from among the children of this world, because today is doing deeds with no reckoning and tomorrow is for reckoning with no doing of deeds. When people, irrespective of their faith, go on holiday, they only pack the things they need and maybe a little extra, but they try to avoid overpacking. Even the amount of money they take with them, they limit in respect to their stay abroad. When they arrive they often stay in a hotel, which usually has the main necessities of living with a few extras. If they believe they will never return to the same destination in the future, they will never buy a house, as they will claim their stay is short and they will not return. They do not get a job during their holiday, claiming that their stay is short, so they do not need to earn more money. They do not get married, nor have children, claiming the holiday destination is not their homeland, where they would get married and have children. Generally speaking, this is the attitude and mindset of holiday makers. It is strange how Muslims truly believe they will depart from this world soon, meaning, they stay in the world is temporary, just like being on holiday, and they believe their stay in the hereafter will be permanent, yet, they do not adequately prepare for it. If they truly realize the short time they have, Similarly to a holiday, they would not dedicate too much effort on their homes and instead be content with a simple home just like the traveler who is content with a simple hotel. So in reality, this world is like the holiday destination in the example yet, Muslims do not treat it like one. Instead, they dedicate the majority of their efforts in beautifying their world while neglecting the eternal hereafter. It is sometimes hard to believe some Muslims actually believe in the permanent hereafter when one observes the amount of effort they dedicate to the temporal world. Muslims should therefore strive in preparing for the hereafter by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience while being pleased with obtaining and utilizing the necessities of this world. It is why the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, 
advised Muslims to live in this world as travelers in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6416. They should not take this world as a permanent home, and instead treat it like a holiday destination. Words of Wisdom number 5. Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once gave the following advice, which has been recorded in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, pages 447 to 448. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, advised that words are only good when they are accompanied by actions. A Muslim must strive to act on their knowledge, as knowledge without action is of no value or benefit. This is like the one who possesses knowledge of a path to safety, but does not take it, and instead remains in an area full of dangers. This is why knowledge can be split into two categories. The first is when one ACTS on their knowledge, which leads to piety and an increase in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted. The second is when one fails to act on their knowledge. This type will not increase one's obedience to Allah, the Exalted, in fact, it will only increase them in arrogance believing they are superior to others, even though they are like donkeys which carry books that do not benefit it. Chapter 62 al Jumu'ah, verse 5 And then did not take it on, did not act on their knowledge, is like that of a donkey who carries volumes of books. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, advised that actions are of no good unless accompanied by a good intention. In a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 3989, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that even slightly showing off is polytheism. This is a minor type of polytheism, which does not cause one to lose their faith. Instead, it leads to the loss of reward, as this Muslim acted for the sake of pleasing people, when they should have acted to please Allah, the Exalted. In fact, these people will be told on Judgment Day to seek their reward from those they acted for, which will not be possible. This has been warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3154. If the devil cannot prevent one from performing righteous deeds, he will attempt to corrupt their intention, thereby destroying their reward. If he cannot corrupt their intention in an obvious way, he tries to corrupt it through subtle ways. This includes when people subtly show off their righteous deeds to others. Sometimes it is so subtle that the person themselves are not fully aware of what they are doing. As gaining and acting on knowledge is a duty on all, according to a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 224, claiming ignorance will not be accepted by Allah, the Exalted, on Judgment Day. Subtly showing off often occurs through social media and one's speech. For example, a Muslim might inform others they are fasting, even though no one directly asked them if they were fasting. Another example is when one publicly recites the Holy Quran from memory in front of others, thereby showing others they have memorized the Holy Quran. Even criticizing oneself publicly can be considered showing off one's humility to others. To conclude, Showing off subtly destroys a Muslim's reward and must be avoided in order to safeguard their righteous deeds. This is only possible by learning and acting on Islamic knowledge, such as how to safeguard one's speech. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, advise that actions are of no good unless accompanied by a good intention. And no intention is good unless it is accordance with the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Muslims should not follow and adopt the customary practices of non-Muslims. The more Muslims do this, the less they will follow the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. This is quite evident in this day and age, as many Muslims have adopted the cultural practices of other nations, which has caused them to become distant from the teachings of Islam. For example, one only needs to observe the modern Muslim wedding, to observe how many non-Muslim cultural practices have been adopted by Muslims. What makes this worse is that many Muslims cannot differentiate between Islamic practices based on the Holy Quran and traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and the cultural practices of non-Muslims. Because of this non-Muslims cannot differentiate between them either, which has caused great problems for Islam. For example, 
Honor killings is a cultural practice which has nothing to do with Islam, yet because of the ignorance of Muslims and their habit of adopting non-Muslim cultural practices, Islam is blamed every time an honor killing occurs in society. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, removed the social barriers in the form of castes and brotherhoods in order to unite people, yet ignorant Muslims have resurrected them by adopting the cultural practices of non-Muslims. Simply put, the more cultural practices Muslims adopt, the less they will act on the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Ensuring Fair Business Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, would personally and regularly inspect the marketplaces to ensure people were doing business correctly and fairly. He would move between the different areas quoting verses of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him, reminding people how they should do business. He would personally correct bad business transactions. He would often warn the merchants to fear Allah, the exalted, and to avoid swearing oaths over the quality of their merchandise, for an oath may help sell the item, but it erases the blessings. And he would warn them that traders are evil, except the one who fairly takes their dues and pays their dues. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, pages 455 to 456. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, would often advise his governors to keep a close eye on the merchants. He reminded them that all transactions must be done on a tolerant and easygoing basis, on the basis of fairness and on the basis of prices that are not unfair to either part. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, pages 615 to 616. In a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 2146, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that merchants will be raised as a moral people on Judgment Day, except those who fear Allah, the Exalted, act righteously and speak the truth. This narration applies to all those who take part in business transactions. It is extremely important to fear Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This includes treating others kindly according to the teachings of Islam. In respect to business dealings, a Muslim should be honest in their speech by disclosing all the details of the transaction to all who are involved. A narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2079, warns that when Muslims hide things in financial transactions, such as defects in their goods, it will lead to a loss in blessings. Acting righteously includes not striving to con others by making them pay excessively for goods. A Muslim should simply treat others how they desire to be treated meaning, with honesty and full disclosure. The same way, a Muslim would not like to be mistreated in financial matters, they should not mistreat others. Those conducting business should always avoid lying, as it leads to immorality, and immortality leads to hell. In fact, a person will keep telling and acting on lies until they are recorded as a great liar by Allah, the Exalted. This has been warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1971. Warning against usury. Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him warned that only those who possessed Islamic knowledge should sell in their marketplaces, otherwise they would consume usury whether they intended to or not. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, pages 458 to 459. Financial interest denotes the amount that a lender receives from a borrower at a fixed rate of interest. At the time of the revelation of the Holy Quran, many forms of interest transactions were practiced. Of these one was that the vendor sold an article and fixed a time limit for the payment of the price, stipulating that if the buyer failed to pay within the specified period of time, they would extend the time limit, but increase the price of the article. Another was that a person loaned a sum of money to another person, and stipulated that the borrower should return a specified amount in excess of the amount loaned within a given time limit. A third form of interest transaction was that the borrower and vendor agreed that the former would repay the loan within a certain limit at a fixed rate of interest, and that if they failed to do so within the limit, the lender would extend the time limit but at the same time would increase the rate of interest. 
It is transactions such as these that the injunctions mentioned here apply. Those who believe this fail to differentiate between the profit gained from lawful investment and financial interest. As a result of this confusion, some argue that if profit on money invested in a business is lawful, why should the profit made from a loan be deemed unlawful? They argue that instead of a person investing their wealth, they loan it to somebody who in turn makes a profit out of it. In such circumstances, why should the borrower not pay the lender a part of the profit? They fail to recognize that no business venture is immune from risk. No venture carries an absolute guarantee of profit. Therefore, it is not fair that the financier alone should be considered entitled to a profit at a fixed rate in all circumstances and should be protected against any chance of loss. It is not a part of justice that those who dedicate their resources are not guaranteed profit at any fixed rate, whereas those who lend their wealth are fully secured against all risks of loss and are guaranteed profit at a fixed rate. In a normal lawful transaction, a buyer derives benefit from an item which they purchase from a seller. The seller receives compensation for the effort and time spent on making the item. In interest-related transactions on the other hand, exchange of benefits does not take place equitably. The interest-receiving party receives a fixed amount as a payment for the loan they gave and thus their gain is secured. The other party can make use of the funds loaned but it may not always yield a profit. If such a person spends the borrowed funds on a need, there will be no profit. Even if the funds are invested, then one stands the chance of both making a profit or incurring a loss. Hence an interest-related transaction causes either a loss on one side and a profit on the other, or an assured and fixed profit on one side and an uncertain profit on the other. Therefore, lawful trade is not equal to financial interest. In addition, the burden of interest makes it extremely difficult for borrowers to repay the loan. They may even have to borrow from another source in order to pay off the original loan and interest. Because of the way interest works, the sum outstanding against them often remains even after they have repaid the loan. This financial pressure can prevent people obtaining the necessities of life for themselves and their families. This stress can lead to many physical and mental problems. Ultimately, in this type of system, only the rich get richer while the poor get poorer. Even though dealing with financial interest may outwardly seem that a person gains wealth, but in reality, it only causes an overall loss to them. This loss can take many forms. For example, it may lead them to losing good and lawful business dealings they could have obtained if they refrained from dealing with financial interest. Allah, the exalted, may cause them to use their wealth in ways which do not please them. For example, they may encounter physical ailments which causes them to spend their precious unlawful wealth, thereby failing to use it in ways pleasing to them. The overall loss has a spiritual aspect also. The more they deal with financial interest, the greater their greed becomes meaning. Their greed for worldly things is never satisfied, which by definition makes them poor even if they possess much wealth. These people will go from one worldly issue to another throughout the day, failing to achieve contentment, as they lost the grace which accompanies lawful business and wealth. This may even push them towards gaining more unlawful wealth through financial interest and other means. The loss in the hereafter is more obvious. They will be left empty-handed on the day of judgment, as no good deed which is rooted in the unlawful, such as giving charity with unlawful wealth, is accepted by Allah, the exalted. It does not take a scholar to determine where this person is likely to end up on Judgment Day. There is a huge difference between lawful business transactions and interest-related transactions. The former plays a beneficial role in society, whereas the latter leads to its decline. By its very nature interest breeds greed, selfishness, apathy and cruelty towards others. It leads to the worship of wealth and destroys compassion and unity with others. Thus it can ruin society from both an economic and a moral viewpoint. Charity, on the other hand, is the outcome of generosity and compassion. Due to mutual cooperation and goodwill, the society will develop positively, which in turn benefits everyone. It is obvious that if there is a society whose individuals are selfish in their dealings with one another, 
in which the interests of the rich are directly opposed to the interests of the common people, that society does not rest on stable foundations. In such a society, instead of love and compassion, there is bound to grow mutual spite and bitterness. To conclude, when people fulfill their own needs and the needs of their dependents, and then spend in charitable ways with their surplus wealth or take part in mutually lawful business ventures, then the trade, industry and agriculture in such a society will improve. The standard of living within the society will rise and production in it will be much higher than in societies where economic activity is constricted by financial interest. Characteristics of a judge Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, would appoint trustworthy, qualified and reliable people as judges and urged his governors to do the same. For example, he once advised his governor in Egypt to select as a judge the best of the people, someone who was calm in stressful situations, who did not get offended by opponents, who did not get carried away if they made a mistake, who would not be shy of turning towards the truth when they recognized it, who did not have greed and worldly ambitions, who was not content with one explanation before listening to all others, who takes their time and does not rush into passing judgment on difficult issues, who relies most on clear evidence, does not get upset with people referring to him and coming to him for judgment, who is patient in studying and examining the case until it becomes clear, who is the most decisive once the verdict becomes clear in his mind, who does not become proud if he is praised and is not tempted by worldly things. He told the governor to be generous to such a person, so that they will not need the people or be swayed by them. And the governor must show him respect, so that the people close to the governor do not believe they can influence the judge in any way. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, pages 471 to 472. On another occasion Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, advised that a judge must possess the following characteristics a lack of interest in material gain, a forbearing nature, knowledge of rulings that came before them, willingness to consult the people of knowledge and not fearing the blame of people for the sake of Allah, the exalted. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, volume 1, page 485. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, once passed judgment in favor of a person who hated him against someone who loved him. When questioned about this, he replied that he always passed judgments for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, and not according to anything else. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, page 487. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 4721, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that those who acted with justice will be sitting on thrones of light close to Allah, the Exalted, on Judgment Day. This includes those who are just in their decisions, in respect to their families and those under their care and authority. It is important for Muslims to always act with justice in all occasions. One must show justice to Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. They must use all the blessings they have been granted, in the correct way, according to the teachings of Islam. This includes being just to their own body and mind, by fulfilling their rights of food and rest, as well as using each limb according to its true purpose. Islam does not teach Muslims to push their body and minds beyond their limits, thereby causing them self-harm. One should be just in respect to people, by treating them how they wish to be treated by others. They should never compromise on the teachings of Islam by committing injustice to people in order to obtain worldly things. This will be a major cause of people entering hell, which has been indicated in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6579. They should remain just even if it contradicts their desires and the desires of their loved ones. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 135. O you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves or parents and relatives. Whether one is rich or poor, Allah is more worthy of both. So follow not personal inclination, lest you not be just. One must be just towards their dependents, by fulfilling their rights and necessities, according to the teachings of Islam, which has been advised in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2928. 
they should not be neglected nor handed over to others such as school and mosque teachers. A person should not take on this responsibility if they are too lazy to act with justice in regards to them. To conclude, no person is free of acting with justice as the minimum is acting with justice in respect to Allah, the exalted, and oneself. Avoiding oppression. Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, would always warn his employees to avoid oppressing others. He once wrote to one of his governors and commanded them to give precedence to Allah, the exalted, and to the general public over himself, his family, and those close to him. If he failed to do that, he would become unjust, and Allah, the exalted, would be his opponent on behalf of his slaves. He added that Allah, the exalted, answers the prayers of the oppressed, and he is watching the oppressors like a guardian on a watchtower. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, page 472. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6579, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that the bankrupt Muslim is the one who accumulates many righteous deeds, such as fasting and prayer. But as they mistreated people, their good deeds will be given to their victims, and if necessary, their victims' sins will be given to them on Judgment Day. This will lead to them being hurled into hell. It is important to understand that a Muslim must fulfill two aspects of faith in order to achieve success. The first are the duties in respect to Allah, the Exalted, such as the obligatory prayer. The second aspect is in respect to people, which includes treating them kindly. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has declared in a narration found in Sunan an nasai number 4998, that a person cannot be a true believer until they keep their physical and verbal harm away from the life and possessions of others. It is important to understand that Allah, the Exalted, is infinitely forgiving meaning. He will forgive those who sincerely repent to Him. But He will not forgive the sins which involve other people until the victim forgives first. As people are not so forgiving a Muslim should be fearful that those who they have wronged will exact revenge on them by taking away their precious good deeds on Judgment Day. Even if a Muslim fulfills the rights of Allah, the Exalted, they may still end up in hell simply because they have wronged others. It is therefore important for Muslims to strive to fulfill both aspects of their duties in order to obtain success in both worlds. Levels of Knowledge During his caliphate, Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, worked tirelessly in administrating the affairs of the nation according to the correct levels of knowledge. Meaning, according to the Holy Quran, the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, the verdicts of the former caliphs, may Allah be pleased with them, mutual consensus of the learned and in rare cases, independent reasoning. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 1, pages 473 to 474. This process has been explained in an event during the lifetime of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him. In the tenth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, he dispatched Mu'ath bin Jabal, may Allah be pleased with him, to govern a province of Yemen. When leaving the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, asked what he would do if he was brought a case to judge. Mu'ath, may Allah be pleased with him, replied that he would judge according to the Holy Quran. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, replied that what if he did not find the case and its judgment in the Holy Quran? He then replied he would judge according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, then replied that what if he did not find the case and its judgment in his traditions? Mu'ath, may Allah be pleased with him, finally replied that he would use independent reasoning meaning, a judgment which runs in line with the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, praised Allah, the Exalted, for giving him a representative that pleased him. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 4, pages 140 to 141. Whenever a scholar masters the different sciences of Islam, they may reach a level called independent reasoning. 
This allows them to apply the teachings of the Holy Quran, the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, with their professional unbiased judgment, in order to derive a ruling within Islam. According to a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 4487, when this scholar makes an incorrect ruling, they will be rewarded a single time for their effort. If they make a correct ruling, they will be rewarded twice over. Religious Freedom It is important note that even though parts of the Islamic Empire increased through fighting yet, the goal was never to gain land or power, unlike all other empires in history. The aim was to give the people of foreign lands the opportunity to hear the teachings of Islam, which was being prevented by foreign powers, so that they could willingly either accept or reject Islam. As Islam is a faith which must be accepted by the heart, forcing people to accept Islam through the sword is simply not possible. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah verse 256 There shall be no compulsion in acceptance of the religion. The right course has become distinct from the wrong. Like his predecessors before him, Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, ensured that all people under his rulership had the freedom to choose whether to accept Islam or to reject it. All the rightly guided caliphs, may Allah be pleased with them, commanded his leaders and soldiers to respect and fulfill the rights of the citizens of the conquered lands who chose to reject Islam. They gave the same rights to those who accepted Islam all Muslims are owed, even though they might have recently fought against the Muslims. By implementing the teachings of Islam, just and peaceful societies were formed, and through this many people accepted Islam, after witnessing its widespread benefits and truths. Whether people accepted Islam or not, the Muslims gained the loyalty of the citizens as they acted with justice. It is clear from history that no other religion which dominated a land ever gave such freedom to the other religions under its authority to practice their faith openly and without fear of persecution. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, continued to remove the need for the poor and disabled to pay the tax, jizya, which the non-Muslims living in Islamic lands would pay to the government. This tax was also not taken when the state failed to protect and provide the basic public services to the non-Muslims living in Islamic territories. In fact, during the expedition to Syria, during the Caliphate of Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, when the Muslim armies were forced to retreat to the border of the Roman Empire, which eventually led to the Battle of Yarmouk, the tax taken from the non-Muslims in the areas within Syria, which the Muslims initially controlled, was given back to the people. When receiving their wealth back, the people commented that they hoped that the Muslims would gain victory of the Romans, and return to them, as the Muslims treated them better than the Romans did. The Romans would take everything from them and leave them with nothing, whereas the Muslims were returning their wealth to them, even during a time of war. The tax was also not taken when the non-Muslims participated in protecting their land from foreign enemies. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 204-205 and 444-446. Wishing for the Hereafter After a truce was made between Ali ibn Abu Talib and Muawiyah ibn Abu Sufyan, may Allah be pleased with them. The internal conflict and disunity only increased for Ali, may Allah be pleased with him. He then began to wish to leave this world, as the people were failing to obey him. He understood a people can only be rightly guided when they desire right guidance. If they do not desire it, then no person will be able to guide them on the right path. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 2, pages 609 to 611. It seems he wished to leave this world, as he did not want to be pushed into disobeying Allah, the Exalted. He preferred death to compromising on Islam. Islam teaches Muslims that they should never compromise on their faith in order to gain something from the material world. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 135. O you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves or parents and relatives. As the material world is temporary, whatever one gains from it will eventually fade away and they will be held accountable for their actions and attitude in the hereafter. 
On the other hand, faith is the precious jewel which guides a Muslim through all difficulties in this world and in the hereafter safely. Therefore, it is plain foolishness to compromise the thing which is more beneficial and lasting for the sake of a temporary thing. Many people, especially women, will encounter moments in their lives where they will have to choose whether to compromise on their faith. For example, in some cases a Muslim woman may believe that if she removed her scarf and dressed a certain way, she would be more respected at work, and may even climb the corporate ladder more quickly. Similarly, in the corporate world, it is considered important to mingle with colleagues after work hours. So a Muslim might find themselves being invited to a pub or club after work. In times like this, it is important to remember that ultimate victory and success will only be granted to those who remain steadfast on the teachings of Islam. Those who act in this way will be granted worldly and religious success. But more importantly, their worldly success will not become a burden for them. In fact, it will become a means for Allah, the Exalted, to increase their rank and remembrance amongst mankind. Examples of this are the rightly guided caliphs of Islam. They did not compromise on their faith and instead remained steadfast throughout their lives and in return Allah, the Exalted, granted them a worldly and religious empire. All other forms of success are very temporal and sooner or later they become a difficulty for its bearer. One only needs to observe the many celebrities who compromised on their ideals and belief in order to obtain fame and fortune, only for these things to become a cause of their sadness, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and even suicide. Reflect on these two paths for a moment and then decide which one should be preferred and chosen. The End Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, was aware he would martyred, as the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, had told him. Some reports even suggest he knew who the killer was namely, the rebel, Abdur Rahman ibn Maljam. When he was told to execute him, Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, refused as Ibn Maljam had not done anything to warrant that. Ibn Maljam and his evil cronies decided to assassinate Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, in order to avenge their misguided brothers who had been killed in the Battle of Narawan. Ibn Maljam and two others made a pact that they would separate and each kill Ali, Muawiyah ibn Abu Sufyan and Amra ibn al-As, may Allah be pleased with them. Ibn Maljam and some associates hid outside the home of Ali, may Allah be pleased with him. When the latter emerged to lead the dawn congregational prayer, Ibn Maljam attacked and fatally wounded him. Ibn Maljam was apprehended and brought to Ali, may Allah be pleased with him. Ibn Maljam admitted that Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, had always treated him well but boldly stated that he hoped his sword would kill the worst person on earth. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, replied that he believed his sword would be used against himself, as he was the worst person in the world. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, commanded that Ibn Maljam be treated well in captivity and if he died from his wounds, he should be executed in legal retaliation but should not be tortured as this was prohibited in Islam. The other two men working with Ibn Maljam headed for their targets in the same night. One of them wounded Mu'awiyah, may Allah be pleased with him, but he later recovered and the third attacked and killed another man, thinking it was Amra ibn al-As, may Allah be pleased with him. Amra, may Allah be pleased with him, was sick that day and ordered someone else to lead the dawn congregational prayer, and it was this man who was mistakenly killed. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, never appointed a successor as he followed the tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and desired the people to decide themselves. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 2, pages 611 to 618 and 621 to 625. Final words. On his deathbed Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, gave the following advice to his family and friends, which has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 2, pages 618 to 622. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, urged them to fear Allah, the Exalted. Piety, fearing Allah, the Exalted cannot be achieved without gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge so that one can fulfill the commands of Allah, the Exalted, 
refrain from his prohibitions and face destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 35 Fatir, verse 28 Only those fear Allah from among his servants who have knowledge. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2451, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon, advised that a Muslim cannot become pious until they avoid something which is not harmful to their religion, out of caution that it will lead to something which is harmful. Therefore, an aspect of piety is to avoid things which are doubtful, not just unlawful. This is because doubtful things takes a Muslim one step closer to the unlawful, and the closer one is to the unlawful, the easier it is to fall into it. It is why a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1205, advises that the one who avoids unlawful and doubtful things will protect their religion and honor. If one observes those who have become misguided in society, in most cases, this occurred gradually, not in one sudden step. Meaning, the person first indulged in doubtful things before falling into the unlawful. This is the reason why Islam stresses the need to avoid unnecessary and vain things in one's life, as they can lead them to the unlawful. For example, vain and useless speech which is not classified sinful by Islam often leads to evil speech, such as backbiting, lying and slander. If a person avoids the first step by not indulging in vain speech, they will undoubtedly avoid evil speech. This process can be applied to all things which are vain, unnecessary, and especially, doubtful. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, then urged them not to seek worldly luxuries, even if it became available to them, and warned them not to weep over worldly loss. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2886, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, criticized the slaves of wealth and fine clothing. These people are pleased when they receive these things, and become displeased when they do not. In reality, this applies to all non-essential worldly things. This criticism is not directed at those who strive in the material world in order to fulfill their needs and the needs of their dependents, as this is a part of obeying Allah, the Exalted. But it is directed at those who either pursue the unlawful in order to obtain wealth and other worldly things in order to satisfy their desires and the desires of others. And it is directed at those who pursue non-essential lawful things in such a way that it causes them to neglect obeying Allah, the Exalted, correctly. This obedience involves fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This prevents them from preparing adequately for the hereafter and their final judgment. In addition, this criticism is for those who are impatient when they do not obtain their unnecessary desires in this world. This attitude can cause a Muslim to obey Allah, the exalted, on the edge. Meaning, they obey him when they obtain their desires, but when they do not, they angrily turn away from his obedience. The Holy Quran has warned of a severe loss in both worlds for the one who adopts this attitude. Chapter 22 Al-Hajj, verse 11 And of the people is he who worships Allah on an edge. If he is touched by good he is reassured by it, but if he is struck by trial he turns on his face to unbelief. He has lost this world and the hereafter. That is what is the manifest loss. Muslims should instead learn to be patient and content with what they possess, as this is true richness, according to a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 2420. In reality, the person full of desires is needy meaning, poor even if they possess much wealth. A Muslim should know Allah, the Exalted, grants people what is best for them and not according to their desires, as this in most cases would lead to their destruction. Chapter 42 Ash-Sharah, verse 27. And if Allah had extended excessively provision for his servants, they would have committed tyranny throughout the earth. But he sends it down in an amount which he wills. Indeed he is of his servants, aware and seeing. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, then advise them to always speak the truth. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1971, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, discuss the importance of truthfulness and avoiding lies. 
The first part advises that truthfulness leads to righteousness, which in turn leads to paradise. When a person persists on truthfulness, they are recorded by Allah, the Exalted, as a truthful person. It is important to note that truthfulness has three levels. The first is when one is truthful in their intention and sincerity. Meaning, they act only for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, and do not benefit others for an ulterior motive such as fame. This in fact is the foundation of Islam, as every action is judged on one's intention. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number one. The next level is when one is truthful through their words. This in reality means they avoid all types of verbal sins, not just lies. As the one who indulges in other verbal sins cannot be a real truthful person. An excellent way of achieving this is by acting on a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2317 which advises that a person can only make their Islam excellent when they avoid getting involved in the things which do not concern them. The majority of verbal sins occur because a Muslim discusses something which does not concern them. The final stage is truthfulness in actions. This is achieved through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and being patient with destiny according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him, without cheery picking or misinterpreting the teachings of Islam which suit one's desires. They must adhere to hierarchy and priority order set by Allah, the Exalted, in all actions. The consequences of the opposite of these levels of truthfulness, namely, lying, according to the main narration under discussion, is that it leads to disobedience which in turn leads to the fire of hell. When one persists on this attitude, they will be recorded as a great liar by Allah, the Exalted. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, then advise them to show compassion to orphans and help the destitute. In this day and age, it is very simple to aid orphans, as one can support them by aiding them financially through charities, without being in close proximity to them. A Muslim should know that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has advised in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 5304, that the one who takes care of an orphan will be in close proximity to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in paradise. This narration alone should be enough of a reason for a Muslim to strive in aiding orphans, as the cost of this is very little. In fact, most people spend more money on their monthly phone bill, each Muslim should at least sponsor one orphan and encourage others to do the same. Generally speaking, this includes all types of aiding others, not just financial aid. Any type of lawful need of others should be fulfilled according to one's strength. And if a Muslim finds they cannot provide this aid, then they should direct the needy person to someone who can help them. This will ensure they gain the same reward as the one who aids the needy person. This is confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2671. Muslims must sincerely aid others in ways which benefit them solely for the pleasure of Allah, the Exalted, without desiring any payback from people, as this only leads to their reward being cancelled. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 264. O you who have believed, do not invalidate your charities with reminders of it or injury. Simply put, if a Muslim desires the aid of Allah, the Exalted, in their moment of need, then they must strive to aid others when they are in need. This has been advised in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4893. But those who turn away from helping others may well be left stranded in their time of need. If Muslims desire to demonstrate true gratitude to Allah, the Exalted, so that they receive an increase in blessings, then they must use the blessings they already possess correctly, as prescribed by Islam. Chapter 14 Ibrahim, verse 7 And remember when your Lord proclaimed, If you are grateful, I will surely increase you in favor. An aspect of this is helping the needy with whatever one possesses, such as good advice. One should understand a vital point which will prevent them from becoming proud. Namely, the help they offer the needy is not innately theirs. It was created and therefore belongs to Allah, the Exalted, and they must therefore use it according to the wishes of the true owner by helping the needy. 
In reality, the needy are doing their helper a favor as they will receive reward from Allah, the Exalted. If there was no one in need, people would lose out on this method of gaining much reward. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, then advised them to act upon the Book of Allah, the Exalted. In a narration found in Imam Manzari's Awareness and Apprehension, number 30, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the Holy Quran will intercede on Judgment Day. Those who follow it during their lives on earth will be led to paradise on Judgment Day. But those who neglect it during their lives on earth will find that it pushes them into hell on Judgment Day. The Holy Quran is a book of guidance. It is not merely a book of recitation. Muslims must therefore strive to fulfill all aspects of the Holy Quran to ensure that it guides them to success in both worlds. The first aspect is reciting it correctly and regularly. The second aspect is to understand it. And the final aspect is to act on its teachings according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Those who behave in such a manner are the ones who are given glad tidings of right guidance through every difficulty in this world and its intercession on the Day of Judgment. But as warned by this narration, the Holy Quran is only guidance and a mercy for those who correctly act on its aspects according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. But those who misinterpret it and instead act according to their desires in order to gain worldly things such as fame, will be deprived of this right guidance and its intercession on Judgment Day. In fact, their complete loss in both worlds will only increase until they sincerely repent. Chapter 17 Al-Isra, verse 82 And we send down of the Quran that which is healing and mercy for the believers, but it does not increase the wrongdoers except in loss. Finally, it is important to understand that even though the Holy Quran is a cure for worldly problems, a Muslim should not only use it for this purpose. Meaning, they should not only recite it in order to fix their worldly problems thereby. Treating the Holy Quran like a tool which is removed during a difficulty and then placed back in a toolbox. The main function of the Holy Quran is to guide one to the hereafter safely. Neglecting this main function and only using it to fix one's worldly problems is not correct as it contradicts the behavior of a true Muslim. It is like the one who purchases a car with many different accessories yet it possesses no engine. There is no doubt that this person is simply foolish. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, then advise them not to fear the blame of a critic when striving for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. A Muslim should always remember that there are two types of people. The first are rightly guided, as their criticism of others is based on the criticism and advice found in the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. This type will always be constructive and guide one to blessings and the pleasure of Allah, the Exalted, in both worlds. These people will also refrain from over or under praising others. Over praising others can cause them to become proud and arrogant. Under praising others can lead them to becoming lazy and put them off from doing good. This reaction is often observed in children. Praising according to the teachings of Islam will inspire others to strive harder in both worldly and religious matters, and it will prevent them from becoming arrogant. Therefore, the praise and constructive criticism of this person should be accepted and acted upon, even if it comes from a stranger. The second type of person criticizes based on their own desires. This criticism is mostly unconstructive and only shows one's bad mood and attitude. These people often over and under praise others as they act based on their own desires. The negative effects of these two were mentioned earlier. Therefore, the criticism and praise of this person should be ignored in the majority of cases, even if it comes from a loved one, as it will only cause one to become unnecessarily sad in cases of criticism and arrogant in cases of praise. It is important to remember that a person who overpraises others will often over-criticize them too. The rule one should always follow is that they should only accept the criticism and praise based on the teachings of Islam. All other things should be ignored and not taken personally. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, then advise them to forgive others. 
All Muslims hope that on Judgment Day Allah, the Exalted, will put aside, overlook and forgive their past mistakes and sins. But the strange thing is that most of these same Muslims who hope and pray for this, do not treat others in the same way. Meaning, they often latch on to the past mistakes of others and use them as weapons against them. This is not referring to those mistakes which have an effect on the present or future. For example, a car accident caused by a driver which physically disables another person is a mistake which will affect the victim in the present and future. This type of mistake is understandably difficult to let go and overlook. But many Muslims often latch on to the mistakes of others which do not influence the future in any way, such as a verbal insult. Even though the mistake has faded away, yet these people insist on reviving and using it against others when the opportunity presents itself. It is a very sad mentality to possess, as one should understand that people are not angels. At the very least a Muslim who hopes for Allah, the Exalted, to overlook their past mistakes should overlook the past mistakes of others. Those who refuse to behave in this manner, will find that the majority of their relationships are fractured as no relationship is perfect. They will always be a disagreement which can lead to a mistake in every relationship. Therefore, the one who behaves in this manner will end up lonely as their bad mentality causes them to destroy their relationships with others. It is strange that these very people hate to be lonely, yet adopt an attitude which drives others away from them. This defies logic and common sense. All people want to be loved and respected while they are alive and after they pass away, but this attitude causes the very opposite to occur. While they are alive, people become fed up with them and when they die, people do not remember them with true affection and love. If they do remember them, it is merely out of custom. Letting the past go does not mean one needs to be overly nice to others, but the least one can do is be respectful according to the teachings of Islam. This does not cost anything and requires little effort. One should therefore learn to overlook and let the past mistakes of people go. Perhaps then Allah, the Exalted, will overlook their past mistakes on the Day of Judgment. Chapter 24 and Nur, verse 22. And let them pardon and overlook. Would you not like that Allah should forgive you? And Allah is forgiving and merciful. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, then advise them to suppress their anger. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6116, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised a person not to get angry. In reality, this narration does not mean a person should never get angry, as anger is an innate characteristic which is even found in the Holy Prophets, peace be upon them. In fact, in some rare cases anger can be useful for example, in self-defense. This narration actually means that a person should control their anger, so it does not lead them to sins. In addition, this narration shows that anger can lead to many evils and controlling it leads to much good. Firstly, this advice is a command to adopt all the good characteristics which will encourage one to control their anger, such as patience. This narration also indicates that a person should not act according to their anger. Instead, they should struggle with themselves in order to control it so that it does not lead them to sins. Controlling anger for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, is a great deed and leads to divine love. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 134. Who restrain anger and who pardon the people, and Allah loves the doers of good. There are many teachings within Islam which encourage Muslims to control their anger. For example, as anger is linked to and inspired by the devil a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3282, advises that an angry person should seek refuge in Allah, the Exalted, from the devil. An angered Muslim has been advised in a narration found in Jaimi at Termidi, number 2191, to cling to the ground. This could mean that they should prostrate on the earth until they calm down. In fact, the more one takes an inactive body position, the less chance they will lash out in anger. This has been indicated in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4782. Acting on this advice allows one to imprison their anger within themselves until it passes so that it does not negatively affect others. 
A Muslim who is angered should follow the advice given in the narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4784. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised the angry Muslim to perform ablution. This is because water counters the innate characteristic of anger, namely, heat. If one then offers prayer, this would help them control their anger further and lead to a great reward. The advice discussed so far helps an angry Muslim to control their physical actions. In order to control one's speech, it is best to refrain from speaking when angered. Unfortunately, words can often have more of a lasting effect on others than physical actions. Countless relationships have been fractured and broken because of words spoken in anger. This behavior often leads to other sins and crimes as well. It is important for a Muslim to note the narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 3970, which warns that it only takes a single evil word to cause a person to plunge into hell on Judgment Day. Controlling anger is a great virtue and the one who masters this has been described by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, as a strong person in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6114. In fact, the one who swallows their anger for the sake of Allah, the exalted, meaning they do not commit a sin because of their anger, will have their heart filled with peace and true faith. This has been advised in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4778. This is a characteristic of the sound heart which is mentioned in the Holy Quran. It is the only heart which will be granted safety on the Day of Judgment. Chapter 26 Ash-Shu'ara, verses 88 and 89. The day when there will not benefit anyone well for children, but only one who comes to Allah with a sound heart. As mentioned earlier, anger within limits can be useful. It should be used for repelling harm to oneself, faith and possessions, which if done correctly, according to the teachings of Islam, is counted as anger for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. This was the state of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, who was never angered for the sake of his own desires. He only became angry for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, which is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6050. The character of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was the Holy Quran, which has been advised in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 1739. This means he would be pleased with what it was pleased with, and angered with what it was angered with. It is important to note, that becoming angered only for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, is praiseworthy, but if this anger causes one to exceed the limits, then it becomes blameworthy. It is absolutely vital for one to control their anger according to the teachings of Islam, even when they are angered for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. A narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4901, warns of a worshipper who angrily claimed Allah, the Exalted, would not forgive a specific sinful person. As a result, this worshipper will be sent to hell, while the sinner will be forgiven on Judgment Day. The origins of evil consist of four things, failing to control one's desire, fear, evil appetites and anger. Therefore, the one who accepts the advice of this narration will remove a quarter of evil from their character and life. To conclude, it is vital for Muslims to control their anger so it does not cause them to act or speak in a way which will lead them to a great regret in both this world and the next. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, then advised them to never stop seeking Islamic knowledge. In a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 219, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that learning one verse of the Holy Quran is better than offering 100 cycles of voluntary prayer. And learning a topic of Islamic knowledge, even if one does not act on it, is better than offering 1,000 cycles of voluntary prayer. Learning a verse includes studying and more importantly, practically implementing its teachings in one's life. And it is important to note, a Muslim will only gain this reward when they sincerely strive to act on the topic of knowledge they have learned and practically implement it when the opportunity presents itself. Only when one does not gain the opportunity to act on their topic of Islamic knowledge will they gain the reward of offering 1,000 cycles of prayer, even if they do not actually act on it. This is because Allah, the Exalted, 
judges and rewards people based on their intention and will therefore grant reward to those who would sincerely act when given the opportunity. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number one. Finally, as indicated by the main narration under discussion, gaining and acting on knowledge is far superior to voluntary worship. This is because the majority do not understand the Arabic language and are therefore less likely to change their behavior and obedience to Allah, the Exalted, in a positive way, as they do not understand the language they use to worship Allah, the Exalted. Whereas, learning and acting on knowledge is much more likely to inspire one to change for the better. This is the reason why some Muslims spend decades performing voluntary worship yet, do not improve their behavior towards Allah, the Exalted, or people in the slightest. This by far is not the best course of action. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, then advise them to verify facts before making decisions. One can imagine how difficult the spreading of unauthentic news is to control, especially in this time of social media. It is therefore important for Muslims to act on the following verse of the Holy Quran and not spread information to others, even if they believe they are benefiting others by doing so without verifying the information first. Meaning, they should ensure it comes from a reliable source and is accurate. Chapter 49 Al-Hajarat, verse 6 O you who have believed, if there comes to you a disobedient one with information, investigate, lest you harm a people out of ignorance and become, over what you have done, regretful. Even though, this verse indicates a wicked person spreading news it can still apply to all people which share information with others. As mentioned in this verse a person may believe they are helping others, but by spreading unverified information they might harm others instead, such as emotional harm. Unfortunately, many Muslims are heedless to this and have a habit of simply forwarding information through text messages and social media applications without verifying it. In cases where the information is connected to religious matters, it is even more important to verify the information before spreading it. As one may get punished for the actions of others based on the incorrect information they provided them. This has been indicated in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 2351. In addition, with everything that is going on in the world and how it is affecting Muslims, it is even more important to verify information, as warning others over things which did not happen only creates distress in society and furthers the rift between Muslims and other communities. This contradicts Islamic teachings. A Muslim needs to understand that Allah, the Exalted, will not question why they did not share unverified information with others on Judgment Day. But he will certainly question them if they do share information with others, whether it is verified or not. Therefore, an intelligent Muslim will only share verified information and anything which is not verified, they will leave, knowing they will not be held accountable for it. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, then advise them to be good neighbors. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6014, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that he was encouraged to treat neighbors kindly to such an extent that he thought that a neighbor would become an heir of every Muslim. Unfortunately, this duty is often neglected, even though treating one's neighbor kindly is an important aspect of Islam. First of all, it is important to note that a person's neighbor in Islam includes all those people who are living within 40 houses in each direction to a Muslim's home. This is confirmed in Imam Bukhari's Adab al-Mufrad, number 109. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once connected belief in Allah, the Exalted, and Judgment Day to treating a neighbor kindly in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 174. This narration alone is enough to indicate the seriousness of treating neighbors kindly. A narration found in Imam Bukhari's Adab al-Mufrat, number 119, warns that a woman who fulfilled her obligatory duties and offered much voluntary worship would go to hell because she mistreated her neighbors through her speech. If this is the case for the one who harms their neighbor through words, can one imagine the seriousness of physically harming one's neighbor? A Muslim must be patient when mistreated by their neighbor. In fact, a Muslim should treat them kindly in cases like this. 
Repaying good with good is not difficult. A good neighbor is the one who repays harm with good. A Muslim should respect the private space of their neighbor's property, but at the same time greet them and offer them help without being too intrusive. They should be supported by whatever means is available to a person, such as financial or emotional support. A Muslim should always conceal the faults of their neighbors. The one who conceals the faults of others will have their faults concealed by Allah, the Exalted. And the one who exposes the faults of others, Allah, the Exalted, will expose their faults and publicly disgrace them. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4880. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, then advised them to command good and forbid evil. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2686, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that failing to fulfill the important duty of commanding good and forbidding evil can be understood with the example of a boat with two levels full of people. The people on the lower level keep disturbing the people on the upper level whenever they desire to access water. So they decide to drill a hole in the lower level so that they can access water directly. If the people on the upper level fail to stop them, they will all surely drown. It is important for Muslims to never give up commanding good and forbidding evil according to their knowledge in a gentle way. A Muslim should never believe that as long as they obey Allah, the exalted, other misguided people will not be able to affect them in a negative way. A good apple will eventually get affected when placed with rotten apples. Similarly, the Muslim who fails to command others to do good will eventually be affected by their negative behavior, whether it is subtle or apparent. Even if the wider society has become heedless, one should never give up advising their dependents, such as their family, as not only will their negative behavior affect them more, but this is a duty on all Muslims, according to a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2928. Even if a Muslim is ignored by others, they should discharge their duty by persistently advising them in a gentle way, which is supported by strong evidence and knowledge. Only in this way will they be protected from their negative effects and pardoned on the Day of Judgment. But if they only care about themselves and ignore the actions of others, it is feared that the negative effects of others may well lead to their eventual misguidance. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, then advised them to uphold ties with their relatives so that their reckoning with Allah, the Exalted, would be easy. Upholding the ties of kinship is a vital aspect of Islam which cannot be abandoned if one desires success in both worlds. A true sign of one's faith is not spending all day worshipping Allah, the Exalted, in a mosque, but it is to fulfill the rights of Allah, the Exalted, and to fulfill the rights of the creation. One of the most important rights of the creation is to uphold the ties of kinship. One can feign piety by dressing Islamically, but they cannot deceive Allah, the Exalted. When one turns the pages of history, they will always observe that the pious servants of Allah, the Exalted, maintain their ties of kinship. Even when their relatives mistreated them, they still responded with kindness. Chapter 41 Fusilat, verse 34 and not equal are the good deed and the bad. Repel evil by that deed which is better, and thereupon the one whom between you and him is enmity will become as though he was a devoted friend. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6525, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Allah, the Exalted, will always aid the one who strives to maintain their ties of kinship, even if their relatives make things difficult for them. Replying good with good is not special whereas, replying good to evil is the sign of a sincere believer. The former behavior is even seen in animals. In most cases, when one treats an animal kindly, it will in turn show affection back. It is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 5991, that the one who truly upholds the bonds of kinship is the one who maintains ties even when their relatives sever them. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was constantly terrorized by most of his relatives but he always showed kindness towards them. It is commonly known that one cannot achieve success without the closeness of Allah, the Exalted. 
but in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 5987, Allah, the Exalted, has clearly declared that he will sever bonds with the one who cuts their ties of kinship over worldly reasons. Bear in mind, this is true irrespective of how much one struggles to fulfill the rights of Allah, the Exalted, in the form of worship such as the obligatory prayers. If Allah, the Exalted, cuts ties with a Muslim, how can they achieve his closeness and eternal success? In addition, in most cases Allah, the Exalted, delays the punishment of sins in order to give people the opportunity to repent. But breaking the ties of kinship over worldly reasons is punished swiftly. This has been confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 4212. Unfortunately, severing ties is commonly seen in the world today. People easily sever ties of kinship over petty worldly reasons. They fail to recognize that any loss which occurs in the material world is temporary, but if they are disconnected from Allah, the Exalted, they will face prolonged suffering in both worlds. A reason for breaking the ties of kinship, which is commonly seen within the Islamic community, is when one reaches a higher social status through their occupation. This inspires them to discard their relatives, as they believe they are not worthy of interacting with them anymore. Their love for their wealth and social status pushes them to the doors of paranoia, which convinces them that their relatives only wish to take their wealth from them. The Holy Quran indicates that these bonds will be questioned about on the Day of Judgment. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 1 And fear Allah through whom you ask one another and the wombs. Indeed Allah is ever over you, an observer. This verse also clearly indicates that one cannot obtain piety without upholding the ties of kinship. So those who believe they can achieve it through excess worship and fasting are proven wrong and must therefore change their behavior. Islam teaches Muslims to uphold all ties of kinship by aiding their relatives in matters which are good whenever and wherever possible. They have been ordered to adopt a constructive mindset which unites relatives for the benefit of society rather than a destructive mentality which only causes divisions within families. According to a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4919, creating divisions amongst people leads to one's destruction. Those who sever their ties of kinship have been cursed in the Holy Quran. Chapter 47 Muhammad, verses 22 to 23. So would you perhaps, if you turned away, cause corruption on earth and sever your ties of relationship. Those who do so are the ones that Allah has cursed. How can one achieve their lawful desires in this world or in the next when they are encompassed with the curse of Allah, the Exalted, and deprived of His mercy? Islam does not order one to go beyond their means in supporting their relatives, nor does it ask them to sacrifice the limits of Allah, the Exalted, for their relatives, as there is no obedience to the creation if it means disobedience to the Creator. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2625. Therefore, one should never join their relatives in ACTS of evil. In this case, a Muslim should command their relatives to do good and gently forbid them from evil while maintaining respect for them. Chapter 5 al maida verse 2 and cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and aggression. Countless benefits are obtained by the one who maintains the ties of kinship for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. For example, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the one who maintains ties will be blessed with extra grace in their provision and in their life. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 1693. This means that their provision irrespective of how little it is, will be enough for them, and it will provide them with peace of mind and body. Grace in life means they will find time to fulfill all their religious and worldly duties. These are two blessings Muslims spend their whole life and wealth trying to obtain, but many fail to recognize that Allah, the Exalted, has placed both of them in maintaining ties of kinship. Maintaining ties of kinship is so important that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, ordered Muslims to fulfill this vital duty even with their non-Muslim relatives. 
A narration advising this is found in Sahih Muslim, number 2324. One of the traps of the devil is that he aims to create dissension between relatives and within society, which leads to broken families and social divisions. His ultimate goal is to weaken Islam as a nation. Unfortunately, some have become infamous for harboring grudges which go on for decades and pass on from generation to generation. A person will treat a relative well for decades, but over one mistake and argument, the latter will vow never to speak to them again. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6526, that it is unlawful for a Muslim to cut off ties from another Muslim over a worldly issue for more than three days. If this is the command regarding severing ties with a non-relative, can one imagine the seriousness of severing ties with relatives? This question has been answered in Sahih Bukhari, number 5984. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has declared that the one who severs ties with a relative over worldly reasons will not enter paradise. One must reflect on the verses and narrations which discuss this important topic and realize that if after decades of sins Allah, the exalted, does not close his doors or serve as links with people, why do people so easily turn their backs on their relatives over small worldly issues? This must change if one desires for their connection to Allah, the exalted, to remain intact. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, then advise them to take care of the house of Allah, the exalted, and never forsake it. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 1528, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the most beloved places to Allah, the exalted, are the mosques and the most hated places to him are the marketplaces. Islam does not prohibit Muslims from going to places other than the mosques nor does it command them to always inhabit the mosques. But it is important that they prioritize attending mosques for the congregational prayers and attending religious gatherings over visiting the marketplaces unnecessarily. When a need arises, there is no harm to attend other places such as shopping centers, but a Muslim should avoid going to them unnecessarily as they are places where sins more often occur. Whereas, the mosques are meant to be a sanctuary from sins and a comfortable place to obey Allah, the Exalted, in. This involves fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. Just like a student benefits from a library, as it is an environment created for studying similarly, Muslims can benefit from mosques, as their very purpose is to encourage Muslims to obtain and act on useful knowledge so that they can obey Allah, the Exalted. Not only should a Muslim prioritize the mosques over other places, but they should encourage others such as their children to do the same. In fact, it is an excellent place for the youth to avoid sins, crimes and bad company, which lead to nothing but trouble and regret in both worlds. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, then advise them to cooperate with each other in righteousness and piety, and not to cooperate with each other in sin and transgression. Since the passing of the righteous predecessors, the strength of the Muslim nation has weakened dramatically. It is logical that the greater the number of people in a group, the stronger the group will become, yet Muslims have somehow defied this logic. The strength of the Muslim nation has only decreased as the number of Muslims have increased. One of the main reasons this has occurred is connected to chapter 5 al maidah verse 2 of the Holy Quran and cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and aggression. Allah, the Exalted, clearly commands Muslims to aid each other in any matter which is good and not support each other in any matter which is bad. This is what the righteous predecessors acted on, but many Muslims have failed to follow in their footsteps. Many Muslims now observe who is doing an action instead of observing what they are doing. If the person is linked to them, for example, a relative, they support them even if the thing is not good. Similarly, if the person has no relationship with them, they turn away from supporting them, even if the thing is good. This attitude completely contradicts the traditions of the righteous predecessors. They would support others in good irrespective of who was doing it. In fact, 
They went so far on acting on this verse of the Holy Quran, that they would even support those they did not get on with, as long as it was a good thing. The other thing connected to this, is that many Muslims fail to support each other in good, as they believe the person they are supporting, will gain more prominence than them. This condition, has even affected scholars and Islamic educational institutes. They make lame excuses not to aid others in good, as they do not have a relationship with them, and they fear their own institution will be forgotten, and those they help will gain further respect in society. But this is completely wrong, as one only needs to turn the pages of history to observe the truth. As long as one's intention is to please Allah, the exalted, supporting others in good will increase their respect within society. Allah, the exalted, will cause the hearts of the people to turn to them, even if their support is for another organization, institution or person. For example, when the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, departed this world Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, could have easily challenged for the caliphate and would have found plenty of support in his favor. But he knew the right thing to do was to nominate Abu Bakr Sadiq, may Allah be pleased with him, as the first caliph of Islam. Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, did not worry about being forgotten by society if he supported another person. He instead obeyed the command in the verse mentioned earlier and supported what was right. This is confirmed in the narrations found in Sahih Bukhari, Numbers 3667 and 3668. The honor and respect of Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, within society, only increased by this action. This is obvious to those who are aware of Islamic history. Muslims must reflect on this deeply, change their mentality, and strive to aid others in good irrespective of who is doing it, and not hold back, fearing their support will cause them to be forgotten within society. Those who obey Allah, the exalted, will never be forgotten in both this world and the next. In fact, their respect and honor will only grow in both worlds. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, was 63 years old when he was martyred, the same age as the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him, Abu Bakr and Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with them, when they all departed from this world. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 2, page 626. A fine description. After the martyrdom of Ali ibn Abu Talib, his son Hassan ibn Ali, may Allah be pleased with them, addressed the people with the following words, which has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 2, page 627. Hassan, may Allah be pleased with him, said that a man left yesterday, who was never preceded by the early ones in knowledge, and nor will the latter ones catch him up in it. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6853, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that whoever follows a path seeking knowledge, Allah, the exalted, will make the path to paradise easy for them. This indicates both a physical path someone takes seeking knowledge, such as attending lectures and classes, and a path whereby someone seeks knowledge without a physical journey. It encompasses all forms of knowledge, such as listening, reading, studying and writing about knowledge. The path to paradise has many obstacles, preventing a Muslim from reaching it. Only the one who possesses knowledge of them, and how to overcome them, will reach paradise safely. In addition, it easily understood that a person cannot reach a city in this world without knowledge of its location and the route which leads to it. Similarly, paradise cannot be obtained without knowing these things about it, such as the path leading to it. But the important thing to note is that a Muslim's intention to seek and act on knowledge must be to please Allah, the exalted. Whoever seeks religious knowledge for a worldly reason, such as showing off, will end up in hell if they fail to sincerely repent. This has been warned in a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 253. In addition, a Muslim must strive to act on their knowledge, as knowledge without action is of no value or benefit. This is like the one who possesses knowledge of a path to safety, but does not take it, and instead remains in an area full of dangers. This is why knowledge can be split into two categories. The first is when one ACTS on their knowledge, which leads to piety and an increase in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted. 
The second is when one fails to act on their knowledge. This type will not increase one's obedience to Allah, the exalted, in fact, it will only increase them in arrogance believing they are superior to others, even though they are like donkeys which carry books that do not benefit it. Chapter 62 al Jumu'ah, verse 5 And then did not take it on, did not act on their knowledge, is like that of a donkey who carries volumes of books. Hassan, may Allah be pleased with him, said that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, sent Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, on expeditions and gave him his banner, and he would not give up fighting until victory was granted to him. This reminds Muslims the importance of remaining steadfast whenever they are attacked by their enemies namely, the devil, their inner devil, and those who invite them towards the disobedience of Allah, the exalted. A Muslim should not turn their back on the obedience of Allah, the exalted, whenever they are tempted by these enemies. They should instead remain steadfast on the obedience to Allah, the exalted, which involves fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This is achieved by avoiding the places, things and people who invite and tempt them towards sins and the disobedience of Allah, the exalted. Avoiding the traps of the devil is only achieved through gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge. The same way traps on a path are only avoided by possessing knowledge of them similarly. Islamic knowledge is required to avoid the traps of the devil. For example, a Muslim might spend much time reciting the Holy Quran, but because of their ignorance, they might destroy their righteous deeds without realizing it through sins such as backbiting. A Muslim is bound to face these attacks, so they should therefore prepare for them through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, and in return gain an uncountable reward. Allah, the Exalted, has guaranteed right guidance for those who struggle in this way for his sake. Chapter 29 al ankaba verse 69 And those who strive for us, we will surely guide them to our ways. Whereas facing these attacks with ignorance and disobedience will only lead one to difficulties and disgrace in both worlds. The same way a solider that possesses no weapons to defend themselves would be defeated. An ignorant Muslim will have no weapon to defend themselves when facing these attacks which will result in their defeat. Whereas, the knowledgeable Muslim is provided with the most powerful weapon which cannot be overcome or beaten, namely, sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted. This is only achieved through sincerely gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge. Hassan, may Allah be pleased with him, said that Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, did not leave behind gold and silver, except 700 silver coins from his salary, which he was going to use to purchase a servant for his family. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6442, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that a person's true wealth is what they send ahead to the hereafter whereas, what they leave behind is in reality the wealth of their inheritors. It is important for Muslims to send as many blessings, such as their wealth, as they can to the hereafter by using them in ways which are pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. This includes spending on one's needs and the needs of their dependents without being wasteful, excessive or extravagant. This has been advised in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 4006. But if a Muslim does not use their blessings correctly, they will become a burden for them in both worlds. And if they hoard them and leave them behind for their inheritors, then they will be held accountable for obtaining them, even though others will enjoy them after they depart. This has been indicated in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2379. In addition, if their inheritors use the blessings correctly, then they will obtain reward from Allah, the Exalted, while the one who collected it will be left empty-handed on Judgment Day. Or their inheritor will misuse the blessings, which will become a great regret for both the one who earned the blessing and their inheritor, especially if they did not teach their inheritor, such as their child, how to correctly use the blessings, as this is a duty on them. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2928. Muslims should therefore fulfill their responsibilities towards Allah, the Exalted, and people, and ensure they take the rest of their blessings with them to the hereafter by using them correctly as prescribed by Islam. Otherwise, they will be left empty-handed and full of regrets on Judgment Day. A Truthful Eulogy 
Mu'awiyah ibn Abu Sufyan, may Allah be pleased with him, once asked Dara as Sadi to describe Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him. Dara responded by saying, Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, was far-sighted and strong. When pronouncing judgment, he was discerning. When commanding, he was just. Knowledge gushed from his person. Wisdom spoke upon his tongue. He shied away from the ornaments of this world, taking solace in the lonely night. He wept much in prayer, thought deeply, and turned his hands one over the other, admonishing himself before admonishing others. He favored simple food and plain clothes. He lived amongst us as one of us, responding when asked and answering when questioned. But despite our intimacy, we would approach him with reverent awe, hesitating to call him out for a casual conversation. He respected the pious and was kind to the poor. The powerful did not dare presume upon a favorable ruling, and the weak never despaired of his justice. I saw him once when the night had let down its curtain and the stars had set. He stood in his place of prayer with a hand on his beard, writing as one who had been stung by a snake. Weeping grievously, he said, O oh world, tempt someone other than me. Is it me you have come to seduce? It is me you long for. Far be it. Far be it. I have divorced you thrice, a divorce that does not permit reconciliation. Your life is short, you value little. Alas! My provisions are scarce, the distance is long, and the journey must be made alone. Mu'awiyah, may Allah be pleased with him, then wept and responded, May Allah, the exalted, have mercy on Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, truly he was as you describe. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Volume 2, pages 628 to 629. Conclusion when one reflects on the life of Ali and the other companions, may Allah be pleased with them. It is obvious they had nothing but love and respect for one another, and any difference of opinions was based on their legitimate and qualified interpretations of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. As a result, they will all gain reward for their judgments. This has been confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 4487. Therefore, no one has a right to criticize any of them when it is clear from the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that Allah, the Exalted, is pleased with them all. Chapter 9 at Torba, verse 100. And the first forerunners in the faith among the Mahajirin companions from Mecca, and the answer companions from Medina, and those who followed them with good conduct, Allah is pleased with them, and they are pleased with him, and he has prepared for them gardens beneath which rivers flow wherein they will abide forever. That is the great attainment. The one who dislikes any of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, should be afraid of becoming a disbeliever, as disbelievers dislike the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, according to the Holy Quran. Chapter 48 Al-Fath, verse 29 Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and those with him, the companions may Allah be pleased with them, are forceful against the disbelievers, merciful among themselves. You see them bowing and prostrating in prayer, seeking bounty from Allah and his pleasure. Their sign is in their faces from the effect of prostration, i.e. prayer. That is their description in the Torah. And their description in the Gospel is as a plant which produces its offshoots and strengthens them so they grow firm and stand upon their stalks, delighting the sowers, so that he i.e. Allah may enrage by them, the companions may Allah be pleased with them, the disbelievers. The one who dislikes them falls out of the three successful groups mentioned in the Holy Quran and is therefore doomed in both worlds. The first group are the companions who migrated to Medina from Mecca, may Allah be pleased with them. Chapter 59 Al-Hash, verse 8 The poor emigrants who were expelled from their homes and their properties, seeking bounty from Allah and His approval and supporting the cause of Allah and His Messenger, there is also a share. Those are the truthful. The second group are the companions from Medina, may Allah be pleased with them. Chapter 59 Al-Hash, verse 9 Those who were settled in the home Medina and adopted the faith before them, they love those who emigrated to them, and find not any want in their breasts of what they, 
i.e. the emigrants were given but give them preference over themselves, even though they are in privation. And whoever is protected from the stinginess of his soul, it is those who will be the successful. The final successful group are those who possess no negative feelings towards the companions from Mecca and Medina. May Allah be pleased with them, and are instead their will wishes. Chapter 59 Al-Hash verse 10 Those who come after them, saying, Our Lord forgive us and our brothers who preceded us in faith, and put not in our hearts any resentment toward those who have believed. Our Lord indeed you are kind and merciful. Anyone who dislikes and criticizes the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, falls outside these three successful groups and is therefore doomed in both worlds. Whoever loves Abu Bakr Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him, has established true faith. Whoever loves Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, has chosen the clear and correct path. Whoever loves Uthman ibn Affan, may Allah be pleased with him, has been guided by the light of Allah, the Exalted. Whoever loves Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, has grasped the firm handhold. And whoever loves all the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, is free of hypocrisy. In addition, it is a duty on all Muslims to avoid following in the footsteps of the rebels by succumbing to the trials of doubts and desires. This is only achieved when one sincerely learns an ACTS on the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him, thereby obtaining certainty of faith. This will ensure they remain firm on the right path, the path of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them. It is hoped that the one who sincerely walks their path will end up with them in the hereafter. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 69. And whoever obeys Allah and the Messenger, those will be with the ones upon whom Allah has bestowed favor of the prophets, the steadfast affirmers of truth, the martyrs and the righteous. And excellent are those as companions. Furthermore, it is clear when studying the blessed life of Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him that he dedicated all his efforts in pleasing Allah, the Exalted. He supported his verbal declaration of faith by practically obeying and following the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. He did not cherry-pick the commands which suited his desires. Rather, he submitted completely to Allah, the Exalted, and diligently implemented every command of Allah, the Exalted, and refrained from every prohibition. His single aim was to please Allah, the Exalted, and all his words and actions were directed to this noble goal. This attitude encouraged him to spiritually detach from the material world, which involves using the blessings one has been granted in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted, instead of according to one's own desires. And he spiritually attached to the hereafter by dedicating his efforts towards practically preparing for it. It was this characteristic which made him and the other companions, may Allah be pleased with them, the best group after the holy prophets, peace be upon them. This truth has been discussed in Imam Abu Naim al-Asfahani's Hilyat al awliya W.A. Tabaka al-Azfiya, narration 278. Therefore, Muslims must follow in his footsteps by learning and acting on the holy Quran and the traditions of the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him so that they too achieve peace and success in both worlds. In addition, when studying his life, it is clear that the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, did not reach the future generations easily. They reached them through the blood, tears, sweat and sacrifices of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them. Unfortunately, this fact is often overlooked by Muslims today, as the teachings of Islam are so readily available nowadays. One can imagine how disappointing Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, would be if he could see how the majority of Muslims dismiss the teachings of Islam, even though he and the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, sacrificed everything so that Islam could reach the future generations. No doubt, the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, will receive their rewards for their sacrifices, but Muslims must acknowledge the fact that they are indebted to them. This acknowledgement must be shown in actions, not just words. This involves sincerely learning and acting on the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. This is the only way one acknowledges, honors and loves the companions. May Allah be pleased with them. 
Words without actions is closer to hypocrisy than love. Every Muslim openly declares that they desire the companionship of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. The other Holy Prophets, peace be upon him them, and the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, in the hereafter. They often quote the narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3688, which advises that a person will be with those they love in the hereafter. And because of this, they openly declare their love for these righteous servants of Allah, the Exalted. But it is strange how they desire this outcome and claim love for the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them. Yet they barely know them as they are too busy to study their lives, characters and teachings. How can one truly love a people they do not even know? In addition, when these people are asked for proof of their love for the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them. On Judgment Day, what will they say? What will they present? The proof of this declaration is studying and acting on their lives, characters and teachings. A declaration without this evidence will not be accepted by Allah, the Exalted. This is quite obvious, as no one understood Islam better than the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, did, and this was not their attitude. They declared love for the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and supported their claim through actions by following in his footsteps. This is why they will be with him in the hereafter. Those who believe love is in the heart and does not require it to be shown through actions, is as foolish as the student who hands back a blank exam paper to their teacher, claiming that knowledge is in their mind, so they do not need to practically write it down on paper, and then still expects to pass. The one who behaves in such a manner does not love the righteous servants of Allah, the Exalted, only their own desires, and they have undoubtedly been fooled by the devil. It is important to note that members of other religions also claim love for their holy prophets, peace be upon them. But as they fail to follow in their footsteps and act on their teachings, they will certainly not be with them on Judgment Day. This is quite obvious if one ponders over this fact for a moment. All praise is due to Allah, Lord of the worlds, and may peace and blessings be upon his final messenger, Muhammad, his noble family and companions.